Do you guys believe in that serendipity stuff? Those million tiny occurrences and chains of multiple events that begin as completely unrelated sequences that all of a sudden by a happy coincidence coincide with each other at one precise moment? I like thinking about stuff like that. In this moment, two major series of events have managed to collide right here and now for reasons that only the universe itself would ever know. The only way to play has been chugging along mostly unperturbed by the goings on going on with Dota at large. We just do these guys because I like to make them and you guys seem to enjoy watching them. Dota could be dying or hitting higher player numbers than ever before and these guides still pretty much just come out the exact same. In 2015, the first guide, the only way to play Winter Wyvern, was released. It was a bit of a fixer upper and we've made, we've made pretty good strides. But while that car is driving along the road, a speeding train with no drive barrels along a perpendicular track up ahead. And that train is the Rubik Arcana hype train. It left the station and added a carriage back when Rubik was first added to Dota 2 in 2012, and someone suggested that his spell still tint his spells green. It took a detour when someone claimed that Valve would never do that because it would nerf Rubik. It got another carriage and a shovel full of coal thrown into the fire when the first ever Arcana was ever introduced for Lena in 2013, and the idea crept back back in that maybe Rubik could get the same. But four more Arcanas came and went, and none of them were for Rubik. Another detour. But then for TI4, the first Arcana vote came to be, and the hype began again. But alas, another detour as Phantom Assassin, the most played hero at the time, wins the Arcana votes. Oh, look at that. Things don't look good for this Rubik Arcana, an Arcana for the 29th most popular hero at the time. But this was not the end. Because if there's one thing we Dota fans can weaponize, it's whining. And weaponized whining is just protesting and campaigning. And so the campaigning began. The idea of a Rubik Arcana proliferated through the Dota zeitgeist, crawling its way from 29th most wanted Arcana for the 29th most popular hero to the winning Arcana. And all it took was four more years. In 2017, we did the impossible and managed to get Rubik to the finals. And still, another detour was taken with Pudge just managing to eke his way into first place by a matter of decimal points. But at that point, it was all but confirmed. Next year, 2018, Rubik would finally get his arcane. Because of that one detour, all of a sudden we've crashed in an explosion of serendipity. While the arcane train chugged away, a separate chain of fortuitous events led me and you to happen to end up making an over hour long Rubik guide to release within inches of a massive influx of Rubik players because the arcane was released just a few days ago. So let's learn how to play them. Rubik is one of my favorite heroes. Rubik's one of your favorite heroes. I mean, R Rubik's arguably one of the most well-balanced and entertaining heroes in all of Dota, which is quite the claim considering the potential absolute disaster that comes with his concept. Like, Rubik can steal any hero spell. League of Legends doesn't have that. Heroes of New Earth doesn't have that. To be honest, barely any game has anything like that. Rubik is fun to play as, fun to play against, fun to watch, and for me, fun to teach. And hopefully by the end of this, you find that he's fun to learn about. And this is sort of unrelated, but he's also huge for some reason. This is what he looks like when spawned into SFM next to a couple of other heroes. But ignoring that tangent, Rubik has also got one of the highest skill ceilings imaginable, whilst also being perfectly accessible to any person wanting to play a new hero. But that skill ceiling part sort of terrifies me more than it probably does you, because you know, in a video series that delves deep into every single ability and tactic one hero could use, a hero with the ability to use nearly every spell in the game, and even further unique spell combos that no other hero can do. It, well, it, it pads the video somewhat. The padding is almost as bad as this overly long intro, so let's just cut the foreplay and get right into it. On the subject of serendipity, let's look at the sort of hero Rubik is right now, at this moment. For six years, Rubik has been the exact same hero. In 2012, he came to Dota with Telekinesis, Fade Bolt, Nelfield, may you rest in peace, and Spell Shield. For six years, nothing about him changed apart from a couple of number tweaks here, a cooldown reduction there. At TI2, he was famously played mid, giving us some of the best players in Dota, in part by Dendi playing him, but he was also already being played as a support. The meta shifted as it does, and mid Rubik was phased out just by the circumstances surrounding it. That happened pretty early in 2013, and Rubik managed to plateau as a position 3 to 5 ever since. Not being picked too much, but not ever being completely out of the meta. Honestly, he was one of the most stable first picks, last picks, whatever you wanted. And then, coincidentally I'm sure, on August the 22nd, 2018, after four years of losing, Rubik finally won the Arcana vote. And then, serendipitously I'm sure, on the 19th of November, that very same year, Dota 720 came out, buffing and reworking Rubik, among other heroes, to an ungodly overpowered level, causing him to be played all of the time. And then, on December the 19th, exactly a month later, the Rubik Arcana comes out. Now Rubik is the fifth most played hero, he's played mid, he's played as support, he's played as an offlaner, and when 
winning on account of those buffs from 720. Increased strength, increased agility, increased intelligence, increased base attack damage, a reworked Null Field making it an even better offensive spell. Well, all I can say is that it sure was lucky that all of these buffs came to Rubik right as the Arcana did. What a coincidence! Because of all this, the biggest part of this guide will be my discussing of Rubik Mitt. This guide was already sort of planned out and mostly recorded prior to 720, so we'll touch on the support stuff later in the latter half. For all intents and purposes though, we are discussing Rubik as if he was being ran mid. Rubik mid is something that makes me really really happy, considering how much I reminisce about it in TI2 times. It works now when it didn't for so long because of where the meta is. Currently the idea of having three farming cores and two supports is the default, when in the past it was sort of two cores, two supports and one halfway in between offlaning space creator. Way back during TI2 it was one core with the mid being a more utility role, and that's what Rubik did back then. Nowadays Rubik works as a mid filling a very different niche than he did back in TI2. His role now consists of him being able to do more damage than his enemy via arcane supremacy with less of an investment into a literally nose rake damage stun in telekinesis, again via arcane supremacy. Telekinesis used to be a 1 second stun that did no damage and f <laughs> with 4 levels invested in it it became a 2.2 second stun that did no damage. Wow! It went 1 to 1.4 to 1.8 to 2.2 seconds. Those 4 levels took away from Fate Bolt which does do damage. Because of Arcane Supremacy, which we'll explain further later, one level in Telekinesis can do 1.2 seconds of stun, then 1.28, 1.36, 1.44. 1 it's less, yes, but you're also boosting your Fade Bolt damage and your Fade Bolt debuff duration and the damage and debuff duration of any spell that you stole. And when you pair up Arcane Supremacy with Telekinesis, Telekinesis can all of a sudden become a 3.2 second stun. All of this is a fantastic addition. The linchpin of all of this though is that if you manage to survive that shaky first five levels, by level six, if you're up against a mid opponent with either an AoE burst spell, a stun, or both in one, you become a better version of that hero. Lena's Dragon Slave combo at level six does 395 damage, but when you see Deal either the slave or the light struck array of that combo, you deal back 560 damage with slave or 472 damage plus a 2.6 second stun with the light struck array, which doesn't include the damage and stun you deal with your telekinesis. If you did add TK into the mix, not only would you guarantee the LSA to land on account of you, you know, already stunning the person you're wanting to stun, you'd also gain an extra 1.2 seconds. It compounds quickly too. If Lena hits level 6 before you, and maybe gets to level 7 as you get to level 6, then you're stealing a more powerful version of the spell. If she hits level 6 after you, and is still perhaps level 4 or 5 when you get to level 6, she has less health, but the same damage in whatever nuke you'd steal, on account of her definite using level 6 to level up her ult, meaning that at level 5 and level 6 the spell that you steal is going to be the exact same level and damage. And this works with every hero, as long as they have a spell. The old Nullfield could only do half of this, and then only partly because the spell amped only worked for magical spells. Now Arcane Supremacy amps all forms of spell damage, magic, physical and pure. Sunstrike does more damage, whilst again being incredibly easy to land with Telekinesis, Laguna Blade, Blast Off, although if you're up against a techie's mid, something either really good or really bad is happening, and I don't really know if I can help you there but Arcane Supremacy is amazing on mid Rubik. It's even magnified by the change in Null Talismans. Man, like, oh god, nearly every single patch from 720 onwards has added to Rubik's viability in mid, which means that a lot of this guide has had to be rewritten. Just as a taste before we delve into items as a whole, mid Rubik wouldn't be remiss to pick up Null Talisman after Null Talisman. With 720's Rubik buffs, we do a not so bad 52 damage right off the bat, but a Null Talisman adds 6 more to that, with Fade Bolt even at level 1, reducing a attack damage on the enemy by 20. If we do a bit of math, we can discover that any hero that does 72 damage at level 1 can be brought down to tie with Rubik's level 1 damage, and all heroes below that do less than Rubik. <laughs> but the thing is, you're not going to run into a hero that does 70 damage. Only 5 heroes even reach above 70 damage level 1. Tree and Protector, Chaos Knight sometimes, Shadow Shaman, Tiny, and rarely Phantom Lancer. You'll notice that only one of them even goes mid. Well, normally. Just wait until my mid treant guide shakes up the meta. That was a joke. With Fade Bolt having a 16 second cooldown, any enemy will have their damage equal less than Rubik's for 10 seconds, with a magical burst to boot. With the added plus 3% spell amp from Nell Talisman though, it gets even more lopsided. Suffice to say, mid Rubik is here to stay. And. <laughs> 
God. That was just one example of one scenario on one lane against one hero. So you know what? Let's talk about the rest. As we go through this guide and as we learn more and more about Rubik, we'll keep coming back to individual matchups where we can put into practice what we've learned so far. According to Dota Buff, using a chart of the most played heroes in 720 and then comparing that with the heroes that are most likely heroes to go mid if they were picked, the most common heroes you'll be facing mid are as follows. And believe me, we will have an answer for every single one of them. So let's start with the first one. Invoker. Against Invoker, you have the ability to reduce the damage of him and his Forge Spirit if he goes Exhort, which is the norm at higher tiers right now and should probably be the thing practiced against the most. On the occasion where you're going up against a Wex Invoker, you're probably going to end up stealing Cold Stamp most of the time, and if you do, you can sort of utilize Telekinesis to throw Invoker into your Creep Wave at the exact second where they change aggro, from killing the last enemy Creep or just Invoker, you know, pushing too far and getting aggressive. Telekinesis puts Invoker in the middle of your creeps, whereupon Cold Snap can proc 1000 times more, I mean, give or take, and for more damage and a longer stun duration every time. In fact, with Arcane Supremacy and 3 levels in Quasar level 6, which seems pretty reasonable for both Wex and Exhort builds, if you decided to max Arcane Supremacy instead of Fade Bolt, each of the Cold Snap stuns would be 0.6 seconds, and each would deal 27 damage. With it lasting 4 seconds, you can pretty much completely stun lock an Invoker and also, as a cherry on top, deal an extra 160 damage on top of your and all of your creep waves auto attacks. In this scenario, you could absolutely max supremacy over Fade Bolt, but in reality that decision will be made by looking at the other heroes you're up against. A bunch of magical damage dealers or anyone with a low cooldown stun? Supremacy first. In fact, uh, and I'm sort of getting ahead of myself here, but no matter who you're up against mid, if there is a Wraith King specifically on the enemy team, max supremacy first always. A 2 second Wraith Fire Blast plus 2 seconds slow from him becomes a 2.8 and 2.8 stun and slow. And with a cooldown of 8 seconds, we have a spell that causes a debuff of 5.76 of those. Add in Telekinesis, and bat 100% uptime. Plus, as we'll test out later, we may or may not just discover that DOT is of the greatest spells in the game for Rubik. I mean, think about it. If it works like we hope it does, a DOT of 5 seconds with 100 damage a second could last 7.2 seconds with level 4 Arcane Supremacy, because the debuff duration is being extended. And because of that extra 2.2 extra seconds, would also, hypothetically, get 2 more ticks of damage, right? Because it's a damage over time, and it would tick every second. So if it does two more seconds, it would tick two more times. That, I mean, that checks out, right? Which then also gets amped by Arcane Supremacy into turning from 700 damage into 882, because the spell Amp is also a part of this. So we're getting the Amp from the debuff duration, and we're getting the Amp from the spell Amp. It sounds too good to be true, right? So does it work like that? To find out, we need to experiment. But before all of that, we need to talk about Rubik as a whole, what he does, when he should be picked, which is nearly always, and then a very, very, very few occasions where he absolutely shouldn't be picked. We'll actually talk about practicing how to play him, getting into the mindset, understanding the fundamentals and rudiments of playing Rubik, or even playing against him. I don't usually do this sort of thing with most guys because teaching the fundamentals of, you know, most heroes basically turns into teaching the basics of Dota. But Rudibig is different. He's inarguably unique, and because of that, everything we do and say from here on in has to be tailor-fitted for Rubik and Rubik alone. The next part of this guide is literally the only way to play Rubik. Listen, Rubik is a hero that you might already be good at without ever actually needing to play a single game as it. You learn Rubik by learning every other hero. You can even learn Rubik by watching other people play Rubik without ever actually jumping into the game itself. Because he's not really a hero that you really need to get a feel for, like with muscle memory and all that. I know that might be a controversial statement to make, but if there was ever a hero that could be best to practice in a scenario where you, for some reason, don't have a computer with Dota installed, it would be Rubik. Pull out your phone, watch pros, watch when they pick him, why they pick him, and what spells they steal with them. Or if you're a cool and unique trendsetter, just watch this. You'll notice that this section isn't how to play, but rather how to learn how to play Rubik. Even if this video was 12 hours long, I don't think I'd actually be able to teach you how to play in every scenario you'd ever find yourself in as Rubik. I'm going off of the give a man a fish fillet, teach a man that that shit cray, or however that old Chinese proverb goes. You know the one. To be able to get us all into the right mindset for learning Rubik, we have to unlearn all of our previous preconceived notions. I know for a fact that you guys started playing Rubik because you wanted to do that top 10 play where you steal that black hole and retaliate with a 5-man black hole on that Enigma's team. But if you want to do that, 
you're coming at Rubik the wrong way. It's like growing up in poverty because you spend all of your money on scratch-offs and lottery tickets, right? One day out of the blue, you'll serendipitously come upon a winning ticket and be showered in millions of dollars. But because you have absolutely no idea how to deal with and manage all of that money and potential, you'll end up spending it all on more lottery tickets and end up with less than no money a year later. But if you work your way up with that $3 a week and start small, saving for a nice fishing rod, then selling your catch at the market to buy a boat, a nice little shop on a corner, all of a sudden you've got a world-class fish fillet restaurant and you're financially secure. Or maybe I'm just getting my analogies mixed way up. But it's the same thing with playing Rubik. If you get into playing Rubik with the express mission of stealing Ravage or Black Hole or Reverse Polarity, you're going to find that while you're waiting for the right moment, your life and game will be lost around you. To really learn how to play Rubik, we have to learn what not to do. We have to practice smaller goals and master them, and then practice slightly bigger goals and master them until we find that we're in a position where we've mastered everything but how to steal those massive team wiping alts, whereupon we realize that we never needed them all along. Here, sit down by the campfire, I'm gonna tell you a little tale. Meepo was the first hard hero I ever played. Up until that point, my most players were Sniper and then Dragon Knight. Meepo was a hero I avoided for nearly a year, out of fear. He'd be unclear to play. And then, for some reason, I just started playing him. I lost constantly with him, but that wasn't really a problem, because at that time, my goal wasn't to win a game, not like, no, not primarily anyway. If we won, we won. I'd still try to assist with that. No, my actual goals were far smaller. I remember my first goal ever was to take off the training wheels of group select, you know, the box select thing, or just a control select, and manage to play two Meepos independently, just for a second. That was literally it. A tiny, tiny goal, but something I couldn't do when I first started. I was nervous to do it, and so I kept putting it off, and then suddenly I just tried. And I got killed. I got flustered and forgot where my other Meepo was, and I left him idle in a creep camp, and I died. But I did it. I moved them independently, binding one to F1, the other to F2. Double tapping F1 gave me the main one, tapping F2 gave me the second one, and I moved them independently. And then I tried again, this time with the goal of doing it, and then remembering that I had. Which was, I mean, probably what the first goal should have been. And a few tries later, I had done it. I carried on practicing a dozen small, self-set goals over the course of a few games, until I got to a point where I wanted to make a really big leap. I wanted to manage to micro away a low Meepo while still attacking and slowing with the other Meepo. Now we're in dangerous territory, right? An enemy wanting to kill me is part of this training exercise and I tried and failed for longer than I care to admit. But every single attempt I made gave me a little bit of progress. I started off panicking and mashing buttons, and then every iteration had me calming down and thinking more, until it got to that sweet spot where it became muscle memory. I remember it vividly. At that exact point where I managed to survive, I leapt up and did a little dance and then died to an invis nix because I was standing the low HP Meepo alone in the bit between the dire top lane tier two and tier three towers. But technically, it doesn't count. I survived! I mean, what are you gonna do? I mean, if you'd call that not surviving, then by that same logic, I could take Roshan, pick up the Aegis, and then die on the way out, and you'd say that I failed at taking Roshan. But I didn't! I got Roshan, and I got the Aegis, I just happened to die in a, another event that was very, <laughs> very closely related. I mean, you wouldn't put on my death certificate died of a car crash if I had a heart attack near a car crash. You might be wondering where I'm going with this, but with Rubik, I didn't practice like that. With Rubik, I went in with him as a mid-hero whenever there was a Tidehunter picked on the enemy team, like my idol at the time, Dendi. The problem with that, of course, is that I was inspired to play mid-Rubik by Dendi's mid-Rubik, but I started trying it about a year too late. Sure, stealing Ravages was fun and really exciting to do, and I enjoyed playing it, but I was ruining a lot of decent people's games by being kind of a shitty teammates. I mean, he'd been nerfed too much, the meta had sort of changed, teamfights would be lost around me because I didn't use my spell steal while waiting for Ravage, whilst also not being close enough to use TK or Fade Bolt because I was afraid I'd be hit by Ravage. You see, you, you see where I'm tripping up here? Like, I don't think I ever really became a good Rubik, even with all of those games. I'm still at a sub 50% win rate with Rubik, even though I won most of the games after this little stint because of how long I went doing this stint and always losing. But it's getting back up there, I swear. I think at the worst of it, I was on 80 games with a 32% win rate, and every single one of those 80 games, a Tide Hunter was on the enemy team. Yikes, right? So even when I was stealing the big olds, I didn't really know what to do with them. I was a bum with a winning lottery ticket and no fish to speak of. So here, as a cautionary tale of what not to do, take heed of all that and keep it in mind for this next part.
Yeah, I don't know what that segment title means either. Basically what I mean is that this section is about learning the ins and outs of actually how to play a Rubik in any position, the fundamentals of spell steel and the plan that you should have going into any game with it. For more technical advice with numbers and all of that, you can sort of wait around for the actual abilities and skills breakdown that will come way later. For now we're talking purely the psychology behind good Rubik's. First and foremost, never don't have a spell on your spell steal. As soon as you hit level 6, steal whatever is available. If you are mid, odds are that the spell that you will benefit from most is also the spell that the enemy opponent, you know, last cast. If that person is mid, they're not really putting levels into spells that they're not going to be using to win mid, you know? The spell that you max is the spell that you're going to be using to get a lead. For example, with Lena, you'd nearly always steal Dragon Slave, her Q, and that'll be the spell that she'd level up. With Invoker, it'd be Cold Snap, with Tinker, it'd be Laser, with Death Prophet, it would probably be Crypt Swarm, maybe Spirit Siphon, <laughs> I mean, D Death Prophet's never really picked anyway, so it's not really a problem. With Shadow Fiend, well, we'll talk soon about Shadow Fiend. The first problem you will face is Rubik lies with heroes like Storm Spirit, or Conquer, or Huska. Heroes who max out their passives or attack modifiers before anything else. Storm Spirit would get his Q, and then three levels in his Overload, and then his Alt. Conquer would level up his Tidebringer, and Huska would level level up his Berserker's Blood or Burning Spears. You can't steal any of those. It's it's not entirely impossible to not be able to cast Spell Steal at all on a lot of enemy mid laners. And at that point, with Spell Steal lasting only 180 seconds, it's probably the only time in the game where you will have Spell Steal leveled but no spells. It'd take too much time out of your farming to go to another lane just to get a spell that has the potential to expire by the time you get back on account of it lasting only 180 seconds or 3 minutes. But what if you're ganking? Or better yet, what if you're on a side lane already against two enemies? With the ability to pick, let's break down the best spells to be picking, almost like our classical power pick. In these very early hours of a game, before team fights begin, your best bet is to focus not on big team fighting ultimates, particularly considering they probably haven't even been used yet. At a time like this, you'd be looking for the best classification of spells, like anything that would be in an AoE that does damage and with a low cooldown and especially low mana cost. Rubik's great and all, but this early, he's not the bottomless well of int and mana like heroes like Pugnar are at the same level. My personal favourite are spells like like Lashrak's Split Earth, the already mentioned Light Strike Array from Lina, and Torrent or Ghost Ship from Kunker. Spells that take skill to land, that can potentially be dodged or have you just miss them, but that pay out in a major way by doing extra amounts of damage in an AoE. And that's stunned. See, the trick is not to ever think of Dota as a well-balanced game. That's the secret. It's a game made by a bunch of people who aren't omnipotent nor seeing. And because it's made by people like this, they can make mistakes and all of these little tiny cracks can form on the surface of it. Think ability draft, right? And all of the broken combos that you can manage in that game mode. And then realize that Rubik is ability draft personified. Abuse the system, man. Split Earth deals a fantastic 300 damage with a 2 second AoE stun on a 9 second cooldown. Why? Because it's hard to land. Lashrak doesn't have any other spell that can help secure a Split Earth stun on his opponent, and so the reward for landing one is greater than your average spell. But Rubik does have another spell that can help secure a Split Earth. He can land Split Earth every time, and when he does it's even more powerful because of Arcane Supremacy. But that's just the start of it, right? The real reason I love and really prioritize these spells over all else is because they help gank, they help defend yourself, and they help you farm. That's the key. In the early game, as well as nearly any point in the game directly after a team fight, you should have a spell like this on hand, support or mid. During team fights, your mission is of course to steal that RP, to steal that black hole, but more important than stealing that big ultimate is actually winning the team fight. And more important than that is actually being able to capitalize off of a one team fight by pushing your advantage. The benefit to spell steal is that it lasts for 180 to 300 seconds, with a cooldown of from 20 to 60. If you manage to hold onto a spell that you can't use because it has a 200 second cooldown, and you keep it for 300 seconds, then what was the point of even stealing it? Just steal the spell when you actually need it, and in the downtime, have something smaller to tide you over. These are the categories for post team fight spells to have on your belt. In order of importance, a low cooldown AoE spell that works on creeps, an AoE stun with high damage but with a delay that can be mitigated by telekinesis, any AoE nuke at all, a spell that deals damage to towers, any stun, an escape spell, and a spell that heals teammates. Those are six categories right there. You'll notice that the term AoE pops up more often than not in that list, so that's the priority. Unfortunately, I can't really give you an example of a spell that does every single one of those, and therefore I can't give you a spell that should always be your go-to selection. But that's sort of part of this learning process, right? I can't give you the right spell for every occasion, and that's a good thing. What I can do is explain when and why certain spells are good, and then have you extrapolate from that data and come up with your own estimation for the best spell to steal at any moment. I will give you as much information to get to that point as I am able though. For instance, if there was a spell version of Meteor Hammer, it'd absolutely be the best spell you could get. 
I mean, Meteor Hammer ticks every single one of those boxes from 1 to 4, only missing out on being an escape and being a teammate healer. Runner-ups to that would be, in order, 1. Split Earth, LSA and Torrent like I said earlier, 2. Pugna's Nether Blast, and 3, and my personal favourite, Monkey King's Tree Dance plus Primal Spring. You can get both of them at the same time, because it's one of those spells. It's an escape, it's an AoE slow, and an AoE creep damaging nuke. I mean, come on man, Rubik even has a cute little animation upon casting it where he shakes his little tuckus. <sighs> but come on man, we all know why we're here. As a break from all of those boring not ravage spells, here's a few tricks to steal ravage. Number one. Play in low tiers. If that's not an option, <laughs> uh, which it probably isn't, you're fucked because you have to play exponentially better than your opponent. Because in high tiers, a couple of Tidehunter specific things happen that don't happen as you go lower. Number one, Tidehunter will seek you out, buying blank and focusing on getting you specifically in any Ravagey casts. Number two, Tidehunter will immediately anchor smash after casting Ravage regardless of if it hits anyone. And number three, and again, my personal favorite, Tidehunters might not even prioritize Ravage at all, focusing more on the insanity that is 720's new anchor smash. And if we perhaps wanted to itemize around stealing that anchor mash, we could, well that's a discussion for later. If you are up against a Ravaging Tidehunter though, remember these few tips. Ravage is 1,250 units outwards from Tidehunter. Spell steal is only 1,000 units. You will be hit by Rabbit. As a fix to this, Rubik's level 15 talent gives him 125 more cast range, but that still leaves him 125 units short. Ags on him, however, gives you 1400 units. The best option to allow us to steal while not being hit by the Ravage. And pair that up with the talent and you end up with 1525 range. If you can't afford that, remember that tentacles take 1.38 seconds to expand outwards fully. If you're fast, you can steal immediately and then sprint out of range, but that is fucking hard. So how about this? How about blinking further into Ravage? Visually it might not actually look like it, but the tentacles push out in a ring, meaning that if you can get over that ring without being hit, you're in the clear. You can steal Ravage, blink into Tidehunter, over his Ravage, and then Ravage him, unless he manages to cast Anchor Smash before you steal it. A good Tidehunter will immediately cast Anchor Smash after Ravage, but Rubik has an only 0.1 cast point on his spell steal. Anchor Smash has a cast point of 0.4. It might be hard, in fact, it might be the hardest thing you do in Dota, but it's possible, even against a perfect Tidehunter player, for you to steal Ravage. You have a 0.3 second window. Good luck! When we come back, we'll be delving further into the insanity that is Arcane Supremacy, and we'll even run a little experiment. Okay, so here we are. It's the early game, or perhaps we've just won a mid-game team fight. We've managed to steal Ravage and wipe their entire team, and then we managed to slip in there and steal the Shrek Split Earth before he died, or hell, even Diabolic DD. Both are awesome, so now what? If you've managed to snag yourself a spell that helps with pushing, lovely. Get a tower. If you've got a farming ability, farm a bit. In reality, you probably know exactly what you should be doing at this point. At this point, Rubik is like every other hero in Dota. He likes to take towers, he looks to get gold, he likes to win. The next question of what to do springs up when all of the enemies respawn and Teamfight 2 begins. The key to being a fantastic Rubik player, just like most things in life, is to know when to do something and when not to do something, when you should steal a new spell and when you should leave well enough alone and keep the spell that you have now. I know the pain, truly, I, I, I mean I know that itch that causes you to spaz out and press as many buttons as possible. I mean, high APM must mean that you're a good player, right? Right? But that's the trap. I'd like to think that a person who is self-aware and self-moderating is better than any other type of person. A person who can make a decision and know exactly why they made that decision, and why that decision was the best one that they could have made, is leagues better than a person who manages to tumble his way to the top. Good fortune and luck can get you so far, but there will be a point where there won't be anyone to help you, and at that point you have to know what to do. Like the great philosopher Kenny Rogers once said, if you're gonna play the game, boy, you gotta learn to play it right. You gotta learn when to hold them, when to fold them, know when to walk away, know when to run. And it's true. There's real power in being able to lose a game and without bias or ignorance know exactly why you lost and what you can do to prevent it from happening next time. There are so many people out there, an old version of myself included, that truly cannot do that. And so they wallow in the tear that they're in because they can't admit to themselves that they played anywhere less than perfect. You know the type, they're easy to spot, they're the ones that go, wow, ha, lag. With Rubik specifically, the overwhelming urge is to steal a new spell every single time the spell that you just stole is on cooldown and your spell still isn't. And that's very rarely a good idea. I mean sure, as we've discussed already, if that on cooldown spell is a really long one like Black Hole, absolutely swap it out for something better. But I'll give you two examples and while this video goes on, I, I, I challenge you to, to pitch a scenario in which not keeping them is the best option that you will ever have. Weaver's 4 second cooldown Shikuchi and Earthshaker's 15 second cooldown Fissure. 
two of the greatest spells imaginable for Rubik, one allowing for an AoE burst of magical damage and escape a chasing tool and with a nearly 100% uptime, with the added benefit of being castable with seven times less of a cast point. Seven times! I mean with Earthshaker it's like a one second animation before you can cast it, and with Rubik it's practically instant cast. And going back to what we said earlier about this game being horribly balanced, Fissure is given a giant cast point to counteract the fact that it's a two second, 1400 range stun and possible eight second area denial. Except on Rubik, the negative that balances out how amazing that spell is, is completely gone. You get all of the benefits and none of the downsides. The problem that you'll find with Fissure is that those 5 seconds in which Fissure is on cooldown will drive you mad wanting to steal another spell. But trust me, and trust yourself, just take your hands off the keyboard. A higher APM will not make you better here, just leave it be. But apart from those two shining examples, the spells you steal will be burning a hole through your pocket. So let's learn when to fold, learn when to walk away, and learn when to run. First, let's just list every single major type of spell real quick, rather than bringing up individual spells and anecdotally explaining whether to keep them or not. Ignoring passives and attack modifiers, which you usually can't steal as Rubik, your classic spell categories are Damage, Stun, Silence, Move Speed Slow, Attack Speed Slow, Disarm, Dispel, Magic Immunity, Health, Mana, Vision, Initiation, Invis, and Escape, with variations for being self-casted, AoE, enemy casted, area casted, and targeted on allies. I skipped over one that'll have more relevance later, that being the Instant Attack spell. Think Sleight of Fist, Pangolier, Swashbuckle, Tidehunter's Anchor Smash, and then immediately after thinking them, um, uh, get them completely out of your mind. Obviously, going back to what we just said, most of these categories double up. Some spells do more than five of these. Understanding every single particular spell in their category is way, way less important than just understanding the heroes who have them. This might seem insultingly basic, but it helps to understand this before we get into what Rubik already has, or rather what he doesn't. Rubik's Telekinesis in a vacuum is quite possibly the worst disable in the entire game. It has up to a 34 second cooldown, stuns for only 2.2 seconds on one target or 1.75 in an AoE, but never both on the same enemy. And that's at level 4. At level 1 it's a 1 second stun. Wraith King stun is 2 seconds on an 8 second cooldown. Shadow Shaman is 5 seconds on a 10 second cooldown. It'd be easier just to pretend that Rubik doesn't even have a stun comparatively, at least not inherently. So that's the first tip. Prioritize stuns because we don't have them. In Dota, the perfect hero would have a mobility spell, an AoE low cooldown nuke for creeps and heroes alike, a form of health and mana regen, a physical damage amplifier, and a stun. Funnily enough, that also fits the description of every single League of Legends character. Go figure. Rubik has the nuke, Rubik can't really afford to pay attention to physical damage, Rubik can buy 4 staffs and blink daggers for the mobility, what he can't supplement in items is that disable. I mean what's he gonna do, steal troll warlord's melee form and buy basher? The closest thing we can find to a disable in an item is meteor hammer, which I already suggested that we pick up. The glaring hole in our kit right now is that stun, so if we don't have one, we should get one. Immediately after that, prioritize any and all spells that persist after you've stolen a new spell. Think uh, things like Alchemist's Chemical Rage, Bounty Hunter's Track, Death Prophet's Exorcism, Dragon Knight's Cute Little Dragon Form, and even non ulti spells that are just as good like Ember Spirit's Flame Guard, Morphling's Strength Gain, Undying's Tombstone, and Beastmaster's amazing, amazing Call of the Wild Hawk. Rubik probably gets more use out of that spell than Beastmaster himself does. Even arguably mediocre spells that fall under the category of persisting beyond a new spell still should be considered, doubly so if you have bags, but beyond that, any disable, any damaging nuke is good for arcane supremacy. What you should never bother to get, unless you really can't help it, are really niche abilities that are amazingly great for one hero, but then useless for the rest. Think stuff like Nyx's mana burn and any form of just a dispel when no enemy heroes actually have self-castable buffs. And this is more of just like a general tip, know when you're losing that team fight, know when to run. No soldier ever won a war by dying for his country. I mean it's admirable if you want to have that sort of Boromir slow motion sacrificial death to cap that team fight, but it's probably more pragmatic and prudent to be able to know when you have to cut your losses, abstain from stealing an offensive damaging spell because you know it won't be good enough to turn the tide, and then snag the closest escape spell. It's probably bad to admit this, but I started getting good at Rubik the moment I entered a fight assuming I'd lose it. Not in the sense that I planned for it, but 
but I mean, you, you gotta know where the fire exits are in your office, right? In the back of my mind, I'd always try to keep an eye on that Marana with a juicy leap or a timber saw with a handy timber chain. The thing is, knowing when to leave a team fight that's gone sour is nearly impossible to practice without someone getting mad. Either you leave far too early and cause the team fight to be lost by the fact that you're not at it, so it's a 4v5, or you leave too late and in a body bag. My tip to you in this scenario is to focus on staying too long rather than not long enough. To discover the exact point you should tap out, you need to know when you've missed the mark and work your way backwards. Plus, I mean, if we look at this realistically and not in a bubble, keeping team morale up is as important as knowing how to last hit in Dota. If you leave a team fight early and your teammates notice it, their trust in you is gone. At least if you decide to stay, you and that teammate can go down swinging together. I all thought I'd die fighting side by side with an elf. What about side by side with a friend? I could do that. But maybe even with all that said, there's secretly a better option than all of those. Let's figure out once and for all if damage over time spells work the way that we'd want them to. Let's run a little experiment. A damage over time stunning spell not only gets more damage from just the fact that you're amping more damage, it also gets more damage by virtue of the spell lasting more seconds with which to utilize the DOT. If the tick happens every 0.5 seconds, every single extra 0.5 second tick that you get, you do more damage. If it ticks every 0.1 seconds, then you're in business. To prove this, we have to test it. The hypothesis being, Arcane Supremacy will gain an exponential amount of damage through DOTs because of the negative status resistance giving more seconds with which to cause more already amplified damage over time spell ticks to occur. It's a bit of a mouthful, but I'll explain. For this experiment, we will be spawning in a Bane, who will level up to level 6, whereupon he will skill Fiend's Grip and stun Rubik with it. This will allow Rubik to steal a stunning damage over time spell. We choose Bane because we need a spell to be long enough that a 44% increase in duration will cause it to tick over to over 5 seconds, and hypothetically, extra ticks. If this is true, it will prove the theory and then cause absolute riots because it's broken. So let me tell you right off the bat, status resistance is a trip. Positive status resistance works in such a way that if a debuff slows while also damaging or having another effect, neither are affected, although on occasion, for some reason, the slow might get reduced. If a debuff deals damage over time, the duration isn't reduced. If such a debuff also applies a slow with its damage over time, the slow value is reduced, where the duration isn't. Confused yet? Good, it means that we're on the same page. If a debuff that deals damage over time applies another form of disable, either silence, root, stun, that sort of thing, the duration does get reduced, but the damage tick interval conforms to the reduced duration, causing the total damage to remain the exact same. For instance, if Doom dooms you for 14 seconds with a tick every one second and you have a status resistance of 50%, Doom only lasts seven seconds because it's half the time. But because of that half, it ticks every 0.5 seconds, causing 750 damage no matter what. 750 damage over 14 seconds or 750 damage over seven seconds. Shitty, right? We're not done. <gasps> If a spell affects other units, but is unit targeted, then other units will have the durations or slows or whatever reduced by the main hero's status resistance. For instance, if Sven throws a storm hammer on a 99% status resistance Tiny or something, then all of the other heroes affected by that storm hammer are stunned for the same time that Tiny was. 0.02 seconds. Status resistance is a mess. And the thing is, on the 10 it says that the negative status resistance works in the exact same way as positive status resistance, just in reverse. And debuff duration amplification is literally just a another term that means negative status resistance. It's the exact same thing. I don't even know why there's a different name to it. It says that a negative 44% status resistance should work equally opposite to a positive 44% status resistance. And it probably should. But oh boy, it absolutely does not. You'll see. So a couple of numbers. Rubik Spell Amp at level 6 with no items and no levels in Arcane Supremacy is 3.4%. The expected result on the dummy target after being hit by Fiend's Grip is 500 damage plus Rubik's 3.4% Spell Amp, so 517 damage, minus the dummy's 25% magic resistance, so all up 387.75 damage. Actual result? 
415.82. You know why? Because for some reason it's ticking one more time. I don't know why it's ticking one more time. We don't have any levels in Arcane Supremacy. In fact, when Bane casts himself, he gets an extra tick. I don't know why it ticks another time. But for this example, that's probably a good thing. We're already showing that this game is broken. We're getting extra damage for free, for, uh, just out of nowhere. But ignoring that 11th tick, it's perfect so far, with a slightly off result due to magic resistance not quite being 25% and spell amp not quite being 3.4%. If you were to just take off the 11th tick, you'd get pretty much the expected result, all within reasonable parameters. Now, the expected result for this next bit is that if negative status resistance does not cause more procs to occur. For Fiend's Grip specifically, you get 5 seconds and 10 procs of 50 damage at level 1, on account of the DOT procking twice a second, so once every 0.5 seconds, ignoring that 11th proc, which can't be explained. If Arcane Supremacy causes the DOT to last longer than 5 seconds by at least 1 extra second, we should gain a 12th proc, but do we? Dota's official rules on the mechanics of status resistance say that we don't, and for Bane's Fiend's Grip, it's absolutely correct. We still managed to get, well, 11 ticks. Well, our stun lasts for an outstanding 6.1 seconds at level 3 supremacy and 7.2 seconds at level 4, the damage procs just managed to tick slower in between. <laughs> This is insanity. Status resistance is a fucking mess, and I kinda hate it. But that's a bit of a disappointment. Unfortunately, the way that it's a mess causes more pain for the Rubik than it does anyone else. If it was broken in the other direction, I'd be absolutely fine with it. The one time we actually want it to be, and the game isn't broken here. So essentially, with all of that said, um, avoid DOTs like the plague? Firstly, absolutely nothing I might say next will mean anything if you don't get your positioning right. But then again, that's for every hero, right? So here, against absolutely any lineup, you don't initiate teamfights, but you do initiate ganks. Rubik is a reactive hero, but he's a reactive hero with a pretty nifty zero second cast point repositioning spell. A spell so good, in fact, that you could use it to make enemies cast their spells on your allies instead of you, which is exactly the position that you'd want to be in. What I just said probably doesn't make any sense to you, but I'll elaborate in a bit. He's a proactive, reactive hero. How's about that? Regardless of the specific heroes that you're up against, your mission as Rubik is to predict what spells are about to be used, when they'll be used, and what you have to do to make sure that those spells are used. Like, making your own destiny through cause and effect. It's like me saying, don't think of a pink elephant to make you immediately think of a pink elephant. Cause and consequence is pretty much all of how Dota at high tier works. A hero casts a channeling spell, and the enemy hero reacts with a stun or silence to counter it. Running away causes a chasing spell, chasing causes a slowing spell. The classic example when it comes to Big stealing spells is Pudge Hook into Rot. A good Pudge rots after every hook cast, so you have to know the telltale signs that show that a Pudge is about to hook. Or better yet, putting yourself into a position that makes Pudge want to hook you, whereupon you can steal hook for yourself. Understanding how other heroes react to you is just as important as reacting yourself. Just like everything I talk about, this is anecdotal and I don't really have the statistics to back this up, but I'd say that Pudge would usually hook someone if they were out in the open, not around creeps and in fact wouldn't do it at all if they were around creeps but would immediately if they got out of position and put themselves in between a pudge and creeps. And so with that information, all of a sudden Rubik has ammo with which to cause Pudge to hook him. The consequence of that being that if you were to dodge that hook, you'd be able to steal hook because you know exactly when he's going to use hook because you're the one forcing him to use hook. Wow, it's not really hard to believe why people say Rubik has such a high skill ceiling. Just hope that you actually had your cursor hovering over him as he actually casts it. But that's basic stuff. A better example would be in a situation where you're ganking a Sven or any other hero with a stun plus a follow-up spell. You'll get what I mean. For most of the skirmishes that Sven has had before you get to the lane, the odds are that he casted Stormhammer and then casted Warcry right after if he leveled Warcry. He usually would live a Warcry, people don't really live and cleave. But that means that when you get to spell stealing him, you'll either steal Warcry or Stormhammer, and you wouldn't really know which one he last used because you could use Warcry into Stormhammer or Stormhammer into Warcry. And it's not just Sven, Chaos Knight has Reality Rift and Chaos Bolt, but you don't really know which one he'd use. Usually it would be Reality Rift into Chaos Bolt, but it could potentially be the other way around. Centaur War Runner casts Hoof Stomp and then Double Edge pretty much all the time, it's always Hoof Stomp and then Double Edge. Earthshaker casts Fissure and then Totem right after. So in every single one of those occasions, running in immediately and casting Spell Steel while Sven is in the air potentially, well it just doesn't seem a 
efficient, 50% of the time you're going to be stealing the spell that you don't want. Obviously with the Sven example that would be Warcry. You don't want Warcry and yet you're stealing Warcry. This feels wrong. And then because you get Warcry, Sven will obviously just stun you and run away. So how would we do this better? If we were playing pro-reactive, to coin a stupid term, we'd know that Sven's only option is to stun to get away here. We're ganking this with our buddy Gyrocopter, let's say, and he's in melee range banging away with Rocket Barrage. Like normal, we lead with Telekinesis, Gyrocopter begins his assault, we're holding off on our spell steal, but our two options here boil down to bringing Sven directly backwards from the safety of his tower, where we're standing. Or alternatively, slightly off to his side, closer to his tower than the first option, but further from you. Gyrocopter doesn't really care what you do, he'll be in range with either of these. Your gut would say that if he gets to tower he's safe, so getting him further away from tower to make it harder for him to get to tower would be the best option. But if you were to do that, you'd put him into range for stunning you. A good Rubik, like we could pretend like we are for this hypothetical calm down, knows that Sven is waiting to Stormhammer someone. He's wanting Stormhammer to hit both of you for efficiency, but he has to throw it on one. A smart Sven will throw it on the Rubik because he knows that the Gyrocopter's rocket barrage is going to last even through the stun. And so, bringing back cause and consequence back into it, instead of letting that happen, we throw him away from us, causing him to need to throw it on Gyrocopter, whereupon we steal it because we weren't stunned, and then we just throw it back on him. And now we've killed him. His alternatives were to actively run back through the Gyrocopter to hit us with the stun, or run like hell and stun neither. Y you get where I'm going with this? Out of those three options, absolutely none of them was a good one. And that's the sweet spot, right? No matter what hero you're playing, every single play you make should be forcing the enemy into a position where there's a million options and no right one. Only the lesser of multiple evils. And the key to all of that is positioning. It's a weird thing that if you do well with Rubik, you end up being less powerful, and if you're behind, you have the power to capitalize on the enemy team's lead. Rubik is a hero that has the potential to be level 25 and steal a level 1 spell, or level 6 and steal a level 18 Ag's ultimate. But beyond all that, let's get into the real specific stuff. Wow, it is weird to see that title come up this late into a video. I've been talking for a while now, eh? I usually pull out the power pyramid like two minutes into the video. I'm a bit late with this guide it seems, and I might be even later, on account of us not really being able to just use the power pyramid in order to explain everything without prefacing it with a bunch of information beforehand. Let's give this a go. Two pyramids for two different roles, both converging in the middle due to Rubik, no matter the lane, being countered and countering the exact same heroes. And oh, look at that, they perfectly line up. It's technically two triangles in there, I swear. So here goes, with both triangles at the same time. Rubik, no matter the lane, is countered by the same guiding principles. You're countered by that hero if that hero doesn't give you a good spell to steal, or if that good spell is attached to bolstering your attack damage, which Rubik doesn't have. For mid or support, the heroes that fit this bill are Templar Assassin with Refraction, Life Stealer, Razor, Sniper, and Outworld Devourer. If you're running Rubik mid, the problem is that by the time that you've hit level 6, odds are that they've probably killed you a couple of times and are nearing level 8. But none of these guys have a really good spell to steal. I mean, you could make the argument the Sniper would have Shrapnel, and because of the way that charges work with spell steal, if you were to steal Shrapnel, you'd have three charges, and you'd be absolutely willing to use them all, because obviously you don't care about Shrapnel after you've stolen a new spell. And then Outworld Devourer, if he was to max his Astral Imprisonment, that's a good spell to steal. But if they're playing against you, they're not going to do that. Razor obviously is going to have Static Link, Life Stealer is going to be maxing out his passive, Templar Assassin is, I mean, <sighs> Templar Assassin can't be damaged by Fade Bolt. And the spell that you'd steal is Refraction. Not the worst spell in the world, but you're not going to kill her with it either. Sniper outranges you. Outward Devourer is one of those aforementioned combo heroes where you can only really steal a portion of that combo with Spell Steal. You either steal Astral Imprisonment, which costs a lot of mana, or you steal Equilibrium, which doesn't matter because you're not going to be getting anything out of it. And if you were to steal Sanity's Eclipse, Outward Devourer's ult at level 6, that means that he would have leveled it up at level 6. Which means that you've probably got bigger problems. You're in a very, very low tier. Then you get heroes like Viper and Huskar, heroes that can't be affected enough by Fade Bolt, heroes that have no spells to steal, and heroes that can just orb walk you to death. Beyond that, you'd find heroes like Bristleback, Slark, Ricky, uh, uh, plenty of others, uh, heroes that don't really necessarily combo up with their spells, but more heroes that don't really have a standout spell. Instead, the spells that you will manage to steal will always just be a slice of what makes them good. Heroes that have a fundamentally different way to play them. Rubik is, by and large, a very squishy backline bandit. He stays at the back end of team 
provides throwing in a fade bolt here and lifting a hero with telekinesis there. His goal is to always sit back, avoid direct confrontation, avoid directly needing to initiate, and to avoid finding yourself alone taking on a carry hit on. Any hero that does the opposite of that is a hero that counters you. Not directly, but if you're forced to change your playstyle to get the most out of the spell that you just stole, then you're being led down the wrong path. You didn't itemize towards what you're doing, so in the end you'll find yourself just a poor imitation of those real heroes. Well, you stole Quill Spray. I mean, okay, that's pretty good. Do you plan on changing to a tanky frontliner with your 600 HP and arcane boots plus blink dagger? I'd hope not. Any spell that requires melee range, any spell that puts you into melee range, and any spell that makes you the priority target. Basically what I'm saying is, try not to steal jewel. But having said that, we could have some fun here. There's nothing more proactive than picking Rubik and constructing an item build under the assumption that you'll find yourself with one of those spells. Imagine picking Rubik specifically because an LC was picked on the enemy team. And so for the entire early game, you know that you have the potential to steal Jewel. What if all of a sudden you made that your job? What if that was your goal? What if all of a sudden your entire item build changed and then you just become LC? Let's put a pin in that. Under that are just heroes that focus on you specifically. Heroes that jump over the important roles and make a beeline straight for you. Puck, Tusk, Clockwork, uh, Spirit Breaker, Tinker, Storm Spirit, unless... Flipping over this chart to get to the heroes that we counter, if we were to play our cards right, all the ones that we just listed could fall in here. Heroes with escape spells, mobility spells, spells that let them dart around the fight. What better way to keep up the pace and chase them down than by using the exact same spells that they use to escape? Think like Weaver and Stealing Shikuchi, Pangolier, Timbersaw, Spirit Breaker, heroes that have one spell that they depend on to get the hell out of dodge, and heroes that also have that one spell that Ruby would really like to get. Shikuchi is amazing. Timber Chain is awesome, especially when you realize that Timbersaw needs those trees to be up way more than you do. In fact, just say it like a little tangent, I like getting Shakram and just clearing out any trees around the Roche Pit, or anywhere else I'd guess that we're about to have a fight around. Pangolier's Swashbuckle is an awesome chase tool, and, well, with Storm Spirit, we can do this. Now Storm Spirit comes back up. They get the telekinesis. Do they have the burst damage? No way. No, no. Bounce around. Oh, Who's gonna win? One. It's a lightning battle. No, no. What? It's jump and he got him. Jerix. Unbelievable. Jerix. What a god on the support position. Oh. <laughs> Holy crap. I. Above that, because I guess we're doing the section back to front, we have heroes like Earthshaker, Lestrac, Jakiro, Underlord, and Shadowfiend. Heroes with absurdly long cast points on their spells that all of a sudden disappear when those spells are in the hands of a Rubik. Instant cast fissures, ice paths, shadow races. It feels dirty, but it's in the game, so it's allowed. But of course, at the very top, it's heroes with amazing, amazing spells, and absolutely no way to stop Rubik from snatching them, short of just banning him in the pick phase. You know the type. Heroes like Luna, Enigma, Magnus, and Omni Knights. I mean, it's it's why we're here, right? Those are the heroes that we love to pick Rubik against. And it's never not fun. So let's talk more about specifically spell stealing. Ignoring everything else that Rubik offers, the worst heroes in regards to specifically spell steal are the very few but very potent couple of combo based heroes. Heroes that depend on other spells in their arsenal to hit full potential. Imagine Shadowfiend who has three spells that he combos to kill people, with Rubik only being able to steal one of those. You imagining that? Good. Now completely disregard that and imagine something ten times as bad. Imagine this. Earth Spirit any spell with no rocks. You can't slow with boulder smash, you can only roll 800 units and you can only stun for half as long with rolling boulder. With geomagnetic grip you can't, well, I mean you can't really do anything. And with magnetize you can't refresh the duration. The silver lining in all of that is that lo and behold you can just use earth spirit's own rocks. You can kick his rocks away, you can crumble them with magnetize and no, you can't just steal the stone remnant spell yourself and waste all of earth spirit's seven charges as much as I wish I could. But honestly just being able to kick his rocks away just to be annoying is fun enough. So that's not too bad, but then we get heroes like Oracle. Sure, you can steal his AoE to spell, his disarm and magic resistance, his 360 damage nuke, but you can't steal them all at the same time. When you steal his disarm and use it, you counter yourself by making him immune to the magic damage you've built your kit around, and without the dispel, that 360 damage nuke just becomes a 396 heal if you don't kill him right after. 
If you can steal it, the Rooting Dispel, Fortune's End, is the best spell for you. It pairs up nicely with Telekinesis and obviously gets a bit of a buff due to Arcane Supremacy. You channel it for 2.5 seconds, but then get a 3.6 second AoE root out of it. And Oracle's Ult is obviously fantastic on its own anyway. That's still not too bad, but then we get heroes like Lone Druid, with a no item bear that expires at the same time spell still does, and then ignoring Lone Druid's Q, which you probably actually wouldn't be able to steal considering he very, very rarely cast it. The only other spells that you'd be able to steal are spells that make that no item bear that you have stronger except obviously if you have that spell you don't have the bear anymore because the bear expires as soon as you steal another spell y y you see the trap there then you've got outward devourer like we said you can't steal orb equilibrium spell damage is mana function doesn't work if you have no spell based damage on account of your spell stolen being equilibrium and sanity's eclipse just doesn't work when you don't have any end to amp it with but still our uh, astral is fine and useful what i want to do is find the absolute worst hero with absolutely no redeeming qualities when compared to stealing literally any other hero spells Meepo maybe? I mean you can't poof anywhere if there's no Rubik clone to poof to and obviously you can't steal as old because that's a passive so it's just a two second channeling nuke? I mean that's pretty good because you have telekinesis. Um, what about Clink? Strafe doesn't matter. I mean you can dodge spells with it. That's pretty cool. His shadow walk is pretty good. You can't steal flaming arrows and his ult is based off of the physical damage that he has. So Clink's, uh, Clink's actually could be useful in some senses and then it hits you. BAM! Right there! The absolute worst heroes are out of Titan with no Astral Spirit to stomp and no stomp to Astral Spirit into. And then, of course, ugly, ugly Io. Without Tether, Overcharge is useless. Without Tether, Relocate is useless. And without Overcharge or Relocate, Tether is useless. But you know the silver lining about all of this? You know the great thing about literally every single hero that I just mentioned? They are all the absolute least played heroes in the game. Who would have thought that heroes that require meticulous planning and the ability to combo extremely high skill floor abilities would end up not being popular? What a shocker! In all honesty, I'm skeptical that a hero such as Outer Titan even really exists. I mean, I've never seen him in game. Have you? Have you really? Oh, and before we wrap this up, a special mention goes to Morphling. If you steal Morphling's Morph, it's the red one, not the green one. You want to max out your strength with that spell. You're a spellcaster, so attack speed and armor are less important. In fact, the loss of armor can be mitigated by just a plain mail or ring of protection or phase boots. Just... Never go for agility. Oh boy, we're at the section, okay. <clears throat> Buckle up, we'll start with an easy one, right? The leveling part of abilities and leveling is deceptively simple. You'd assume with so much variation in builds that Ruby could find himself going, that the skill builds that he'd be going would be is equally insane. And I'd say that that's absolutely not the case. For mid Rubik, you'd always go Fade Bolt level one to begin the lane able to reduce attack damage on your opponent. Sure, level one in Telekinesis might work to secure a rune, but keep in mind that the spell does absolutely no damage. You might be better off with Fade Bolt for level one rune skirmishes anyway. Fade Bolt instead of anything else and maxed above all else too. Arcane Supremacy is maxed when you can, probably right after, but I would encourage you to really consider a level in which you'd take one value point and lift. This might be a controversial thing for a mid Rubik, but here, lift is a one second stun and a repositioning tool. You know what other spells that Rubik has that can do that? None! Honestly, with Arcane Supremacy, you're already getting more usage out of the stun and one level plus Arcane Supremacy gets you to at least 1.2 seconds. That's two auto attacks, even more if you drop that lifted hero back towards you. That's more damage than one extra level of Fade Bolt or Supremacy could give you. And it's really your only guard against the smoke gank at mid, which, given the fact that the enemy team knows you're a squishy squishy Rubik, will happen immediately and often. You're a marshmallow. Fade Bolt and Telekinesis might be the only thing keeping you from getting roasted above that fire. After that, it's pretty standard. Supremacy, then TK, spell seal when you can. Your talents would be plus 60 damage unless all of a sudden you discover that there's another way to destroy that enemy ancient. I mean, that's all you really need to do to win a game. Destroy their ancient. And damage is the stat that lets you do that. Uh, level 15 plus 125 cast range is usually best, although you can sometimes go minus 45 Fade Bolt hero attack against Meepos, Arc Wardens, or any team that has a Chaos Knight, a Phantom Lancer, or a Terra Blade, or basically just anyone who depends on Mantas or just Illusions in general. As well as any team that relies on three cores who hit fast but not hard. Attack speed heroes. A team of Phantom Assassins, PLs, Mantas, and Assault Curuses. If in doubt, lean towards cast range more. It'll help more often than not. The Fade Bolt talent is for one very specific specific purpose, plus 125 cast range can be used in a myriad of different ways. For level 20 you'd want to get either of the plus 300 TK land distance or the negative fade bolt cooldown. Both are 
pretty fine. Fade Bolt has a cooldown of 10 seconds, so you're essentially splitting that in half. More nukes means more damage. The plus 300 telekinesis land distance talent though has the added benefit of being just enough distance to be able to successfully pull people off of the high ground, or even just pulling people into the rivers or out of the roosh bit. You'll find yourself benefiting from that talent the most when taking a fight at the enemy's tier threes. Pudge's meat hook is 1300 range. Rubik's level 20 telekinesis is 700. It's not the worst, eh? At level 25, it'd honestly be impossible to convince anyone to ever not go the plus 50% spell aim for stolen spell. I mean, damn dude, all up, that's a plus 76% increase in damage. If you were to steal Black Hole with an axe that causes you to gain Midnight Pulse 2, you'd be able to, with no other items, deal 1056 damage plus 37% of their maximum HP. But you see, if you're dealing with both of these amounts, if 1056 is not equal to the remainder of this maximum HP, so 63%, then you just straight up kill him because it's maximum HP, not current HP. Doing a bit of math here, any hero below 1,676 health will, will die to this. They'll die to this black hole even if they're level 25 and you're level 6. That's insane. That's without items. That 850 pure damage Laguna Blade becomes 1,496 damage. That Reaper Sight suddenly does 1.6 damage per missing health, meaning that you can cast it when they're only like 75% health. Dude, I walk around farming at 75% health. I can enter a fight at 75% health. It's not even really worth talking about the admittedly pretty great alternative because nobody's ever going to go it. But obviously in the name of fairness and to keep it bipartisan and all that, We'll delve into it anyway. The alternative is a massive cooldown reduction to telekinesis. If damage isn't your business, but disabling is, your 3.2 second telekinesis can have its cooldown lowered to just 7 seconds. All of a sudden, that spell with a 2.9% uptime at level 1, do the calculations, it is 2.9% jumps to a nearly 50% uptime. If you steal another disabling spell, you can hot potato them to maintain a perfect 100% uptime on your disables. Add in an octarine core and all of a sudden you can do that with everything. These talents are so good that you end up just being spoiled for choice. And it comes down to a question. Do you do damage or you disable? And obviously if you've picked Rubik in a pub game and are specifically looking into having fun, you're going to be doing the damage route. But if we were to take unadulterated fun and specifically look into like winning, the answer for that would be the opposite of what your teammates do. If your teammates do a lot of damage, you do a lot of disables. If your teammates stun lock and need someone to actually kill the guy that they've stunned, you get the amp. For support Rubik, it's pretty much what you're used to. The classic, right? TK level 1, Fade Bolt level 2, and then we can get weird and max Arcane Supremacy, why not? Leaving Fade Bolt as it is, but like with all things with Rubik, especially that, it's entirely situational. You should go Fade Bolt max, you can go Telekinesis max, although that would be a rare one. If the enemy has a Wraith King, or any other hero with an easily stolen low cooldown stun, just ignore TK entirely and max Supremacy. If the enemy has no stuns, or even worse, no spells at all, skip Supremacy and go back to the Vintage. 4 4 0 oh, strat. Maxing Fade Bolt first, and then, just like with mid, max your spells, spell still what you can, and the exact same talents. And that. Now you know everything there is to know about Rubik. Oh, what did you say? I forgot something. I'm Cleric! What do Rubik spells do? Oh, right. Uh, let's do that. Telekinesis is your cue. Surprise! Probably a bad time for you to just learn this considering we've been talking about it for like 18 hours now. I go into these with the notion that everybody at least understands roughly what the spells do, with these sections being specifically for getting into the really technical stuff. For instance, Telekinesis, like every Rubik spell, has a 0.1 cast point. That means barely no delay between clicking Telekinesis and casting Telekinesis. Because of this, Rubik has the ability to get this spell off before 90% of spells. The only thing that would really beat it are instant cast spells and then item. Because of this, Rubik enters this really special place of being able to counter initiate with TK because his spell activates before another hero can transition from blinking in, which costs zero time, to casting that initiating stun. A blink dagger, obviously because it is an item, has a zero cast point. The only delay that you'd ever find with blinking is if you were to blink backwards, and that would only really be the turn rate. But that delay comes before you blink. So obviously if you're going to be blinking into someone, 
the turn rate doesn't really matter as much. But with that transition from blinking to casting a stun, Sentinel Warrunner's Hoof Stomp has a cast point of 0.5 seconds, Tired Hunter's Ravage is 0.3, Axe's Berserker's Call is 0.4, Chronosphere is 0.35. You even have the ability to react so fast that Spirit Breaker, who was already charging at you, can appear and be lifted at the very last millisecond before he hits you, whereupon you just steal Charge of Darkness right back and ravage them. To make sure that this happens, other than just being calm and perceptive to potential initiations that you have to stop, the best technique would be to actually just mash away a TK on the hero that you think is going to initiate, even when they're out of range. And if your first concern is, wait, how would I know that there are five heroes and any one of them can initiate, just you know, look at the cheat sheet. There is literally a role called Initiator. If you are actually really concerned about that, I, I wouldn't worry. Usually there's one or two people with Blink Daggers who do the initiating. I mean, potentially the entire team has Blink Daggers, but the other three don't use them to initiate. They use them to run away or reposition after someone else is initiated, which is an interesting thing because if you can stop the initiating before the enemy can react to the fact that you've stopped the initiating, they can jump in, whereupon they'd realize that, oh, no one is stunned and I've just wasted my blink. Oh no. So yeah, just mash away a TK on the hero that's about to initiate when they're out of range, when they come into range. You mash TK, press S to stop, and then repeat, sprinkling in some move commands in between to make it less obvious that that's what you're doing. But obviously it doesn't really matter if they think that that's what you're doing, because they still have to initiate the fight if they're going to be initiating the fight. Doing this will allow you to preemptively cast TK if that hero even gets in your cast range. Speaking of which, TK's cast range goes evenly from a 550 radius to 625, adding on that 125 cast range if you get the talent, and then Aether Lands if you do that too. Because of this, a general idea is that if you are in attack range you are in stun range. Rubik's attack range is 550 which is about average right? You'll notice that Fade Bolt's cast range is 800 and Spell Steals is even further at at least 1000. This all means that Telekinesis is the one spell that puts you into the thick of things. So consider to yourself, do the rewards of me walking deeper into a team fight outweigh the risks? It's case by case, but the answer is usually yes. I mean, if you're worried about people killing you, it's lucky that the spell that you're using on them is a stun, which stops them from killing you. But obviously it's get, it gets messy at higher tiers when someone sees a telekinesis and they do that delta split thing where you can only ever hit one person with the landing of the stun. But if you were to see that happen in a game that you're in, that's probably a really good thing to notice. That means you're playing with smart people, and that's a really comforting thought. This is the tier that you belong in. That's nice. The lift duration of from 1 second to 2.2 seconds is always amped by Arcane Supremacy, which has the added, albeit really small nerf, of delaying the AoE stun component of Telekinesis. That probably doesn't make sense. TK lifts in the air for 2.2 seconds, and then after that it stuns in an AoE for 1.75 seconds on anyone in the AoE but the lifted target. You can think of that AoE stun component as just coming after a second delay, which is pretty much the case, you know? But the problem with that is that when Supremacy is maxed and TK's lift becomes 3.2 seconds, it's pretty much impossible for anyone not already stunned to not just walk out from underneath the TK. I mean, you get what I mean? At level 1 it was a 1 second delay before everybody got stunned, which is pretty much impossible to get out of, and now it's a 3.2 second delay. It's one of those really nifty secondary things that you don't really think about when it comes to buffs. But if you do hit them, that 1.75 AoE stun also becomes 2.52. That's pretty good in an AoE. All of this is balanced by the fact that, yikes, TK's cooldown is 34 seconds at level 1 and 22 at level 4. The meat of this ability comes from the sub-ability that allows for you to reposition that lifted hero up to 375 units in any cardinal direction. By that I mean you can't toss them upwards or down. Northeast, southwest, you know. I mean, imagine that, lifting someone up and then dropping them higher up than you lifted them, and then they just remain there because there's, uh, there's no spell that can take them down. The place that you select is marked in a green particle, which can be seen by your allies, but not the enemy. To do that, obviously, you just press Q somewhere else. You can press Q like a thousand times. It's the last press of Q that'll do it. And if you were to mash it, it doesn't make the stun last any shorter or anything. Don't worry about any of that. Because of the fact that TK is a repositioning spell, and a spell that is frequently used to make skill shot spells easier to land, it's best to choose that repositioning spot immediately after casting TK. I mean, it's not really officially stated anywhere, but it's a generally understood rule that all Rubik's will instantly cast the TK landmarker 
or else not do it at all. The reason for this doesn't really have anything to do with you and more with your teammates, because while you already know where the mark is going to land, I mean, you're the one deciding it, your allies want to know these things to be able to, you know, plan accordingly. They want to be able to plan their meat hooks and their LSAs and their split earths, their sun strikes, that sun strike is a big one. If a marker doesn't show up within the first few milliseconds, that Rubik is indicating to us that he doesn't intend to move the lifted target at all. And so the implication becomes that we should all put our stuns exactly in the middle of the telekinesis. And that's a pretty good rule to practice because breaking that contract that you didn't even really sign for is a good way to immediately alienate your teammates. Because of its repositioning capabilities, a higher level strat is to just save TK until the point in which an enemy hero is standing next to any form of cliff, be it the river, the high ground jungle, the base, anything like that. When running away from a team, you might find it more useful to pick up your pursuers and throw them closer to you, as odds are that the enemies chasing you will have to run right underneath that unit and out of range of a toss backwards if you were to toss backwards. It's situational. Obviously, if a level 25 Sven is on your tail, followed by four level 1 supports, it's more prudent to get rid of that Sven by tossing him back rather than getting rid of those other four that really don't pose any sort of threat by tossing Sven who does you know pose the threat closer to you because TK breaks trees it's not quite possible to toss a pursuer into the jungle to have him then have to snake his way out of that jungle path during the laning phase there are very few scenarios in which you'd want to just absentmindedly cast telekinesis because of the aforementioned three decade cooldown because of that ungodly cooldown every single attempt to use it should be for a very very specific purpose here are two if you have a big creep wave tossing the enemy into them will net you more damage as they attempt to escape and if they're near a tower you can toss them into range of that and deal even more damage Another perk is to win that race to the rune. Obviously with telekinesis you can kind of gain a few paces by just chucking them backwards. So right at the point where they're about to get the rune, unless they do that cheeky thing where they deny it because they know that you're about to telekinesis them as soon as they get close, just pick them up and chuck them backwards. And if you were to really want to fuck with them, you could just deny it yourself. It's like saying, hey, I didn't even need this. I just didn't want you to have it either. And then my favorite tech, because you can walk underneath the lifted target, which is something I haven't mentioned yet. When playing offensively, try tossing a fleeing unit backwards, getting in front of him and body blocking him while your teammates wail on him. Fade Bolt is thankfully a much easier spell to explain. Same cast point as Telekinesis, 800 cast range, and what it does is 80 to 320 damage on the unit targeted, whereupon it bounces to any unit within 440 of that last unit that was hit, bouncing infinitely. That might seem amazing, but it can't hit the same unit twice and reduces in damage by 8% with every bounce. Doing a bit of math, by 71 bounces, it does one damage. What doesn't get reduced, however, is a hefty attack damage reduction of from 20 to 35 and 80 with the talent. An 80 damage reduction on an infinite amount of targets. That's literally infinite damage reduction. I think that's how it works. What a broken spell. For creeps, however, that amount is halved, so Oh well, uh, just half an infinity. S so still infinity? Given that percentage drops obviously would affect larger numbers more than smaller numbers, the drop from 320 to 294 is a lot more devastating than say 99 to 96. For this reason, plus you definitely wanting to hit the enemy laner with every cast, it's better to just target him. Because the bounces occur in quarter second intervals, it's entirely possible for an enemy laner to just walk out of range if he sees you casting it on a creep you know, to secure a last hit with the added benefit of hitting that enemy opponent on the tail end of it. But I wouldn't really get greedy with something like that. The bounce distance is 440 and the bounce will always go to the closest unit unless they're invis or out of vision. It doesn't bounce on units like that. It also hits illusions, which is big. At level 1, it's a 10 second duration with a 16 second cooldown. At level 4, it's a 10 second cooldown. That's 100% uptime. The only thing that stops us from using it literally all the time is the fact that it costs a pretty hefty 150 mana. But because it's the thing that's going to be winning us the lane, we absolutely, absolutely want to be able to spam Fade Bolt as much as possible. So clarities, mangoes, bottles, but we'll talk about that more in item builds. It's one of the perfect anti-push tools and should always be used immediately in a team fight and then immediately after it is off cooldown forever and ever until you win. Now, before we move on to the big two, let's put again what we've learned to the test. Here's a fun one. Against Tinker in the laning phase, he'll usually be maxing a laser, which means that you'll be maxing laser. Fade Bolt does 320 magic damage in an AoE. 
technically in an AoE. It's unit targeted, but it hits multiple things. Laser does 320 damage pure on one person. It can't be used to push out creep waves. In a toss up between Fade Bolt Max, Supremacy Level 3, or Arcane Supremacy Max, Fade Bolt Level 3, you'll find that funnily enough, the former gives you more damage on one target, even though that you'd think that Supremacy would amp both spells enough to be better. Fade Bolt's level 3, 240 damage increase, becomes 302, 4 with Supremacy, then 226 when factoring in an enemy's innate magic resistance, plus level 4 laser, and that's 629 damage. With Fade Bolt max and level 3 Supremacy, you end up with 683. One of those is a bigger number, I think, so max Fade Bolt anyway, but that's not really why we've singled out Tinker here. If you're willing to spend thousands of mana on this, it is entirely possible to steal Tinker's rearm, refresh your telekinesis cooldown, cast telekinesis, and while he's in the air, rearm again to cast telekinesis again. It's goofy as heck, but it's entirely possible to stun for infinity with a cost of 425 mana per 3 seconds. To stun for a straight minute is entirely possible, as long as you have 8,500 mana to spare. But if it takes your teammates a minute to arrive, causing you to need to stall for a minute with these stuns, they're either terrible or dead. And all of a sudden with that last word, we can realize the best place to use this spell. Here. You've just been team wiped. Only you survive. That enemy Sven is the only one to survive on the other team. But oh my god, you've got no items. And that Sven has got a BKB and a Daedalus and a Divine Ray. I mean, he, he can kill you, right? You stole Rearm before their Tinker died, and none of your teammates have buyback. You can. To save this game, absolutely stand back and telekinesis into rearm into telekinesis into rearm into telekinesing. That's Sven that's trying to take your ancient, all the while faring in mango after mango after mango after mango, desperately trying to keep this guy in the air because one more swipe and the game is lost. This scenario is entirely possible. I haven't encountered it yet because. <laughs> I doubt many people have, but considering the millions upon millions of games that have been played, it must have come up once before, right? Anything with the word supremacy and it feels like a naughty phrase that I really shouldn't be saying. Arcane supremacy is something that I'd imagine something out of here in an R-rated version of Harry Potter followed by filthy mudblood or something. But Rubik's not like that. I, I'm, I'm sure it's just an awkward coincidence. He's normally a very nice guy, just don't follow his Twitter. Arcane Supremacy gives plus 14% spell damage amp and 20% debuff duration amplification at level 1. That little bit literally just translates to negative status resistance. By level 4 those percentages have gradually increased to 26 for spell amp and 44% for debuff amp. You'll notice the jump from absolutely nothing because of no levels to having one point because it's level 1 is a whopping 14% for damage and 20% for debuff, with every extra level only adding on a measly 4% to spell amp and 8% to debuff. This means that the first level is inarguably the best and would call for at least one level in it before TK and Fade Bolt are max. A 4-4-0 oh build might be really rare to see. Just to reiterate this, one level in TK and one in Supremacy gives you a 1.2 second stun, whereas two in TK and none in Supremacy gives you a 1.4 second stun. Slightly worse with the Supremacy, but it compensates by buffing Fade Bolt and the spell that you end up stealing. The only scenario in which I could see a 4-4-0 build is when the enemy team literally has no spell that could be stolen and then amped by the Supremacy, or at least not enough to warrant the level. Things like spells that buff teammates rather than debuffing or damaging enemies, Hand of God, Omni Knight, that sort of thing. A good way to think about Arcane Supremacy is by potential gold cost, comparing the spell's abilities to items that would achieve the same net result, right? For comparison, to achieve 26% magic amp, you would need 2 Kai and Sanjas, or 2.9 raw Kaias, 7.6 null talismans, or 371 iron branches. To achieve the debuff amp, you'd need well, nothing, because there is no item in the game that can directly do that. Arcane Supremacy is a very, very special spell. In fact, the only other form of negative status resistance comes from Enfeeble on Bane, a hero that's never picked. And the beauty is, you can steal that spell too. You can give negative 104% status resistance to someone affected by Enfeeble. That 5 second stun, 10.2 seconds. Shadow Shaman's 8 second shackles, 16.32 seconds. But what's great about comparing it to Kaya and other forms of spell amp is that it absolutely doesn't matter. It's not a case of getting either or. You can literally get both. You can get Supremacy as well as Kaya. Leaving room for boots, you can comfortably itemize towards either Kaya and Sanj or Yasha and Kaya, probably the former, then get Blink and Ags, 
and two nulls, plus the level 25 plus 50% spell amp for stolen spells, for a total all up of 105.2% spell amp. 300 damage becomes 600, 2000 becomes 4000. Now, just see what happens when you steal Reaper's Scythe, but I keep referencing this idea of stealing spells. Can Rubik do that? Can he steal spells? Which ability would do that? On an unrelated note, next up, the cryptically named Spell Steal. I wonder what this does. Spell Steal is the reason that Rubik is your favorite hero. It's why he's my favorite hero. It's why everyone likes him. Considering what the spell does is probably less important than what we do with the spell. We'll burn through these points and get to talking about what spells to steal and even how to steal them. So again, but the preliminary stuff, right? Spell Steal has 0.1 cast point, a 1000 range, 1125 with the talent, 1400 with eggs, 1525 with both. The stolen spell's cast point is 0.15, which is barely noticeable by sight, but strangely noticeable by feel. New players who only started playing Rubik after this change from zero cast point to 0.15 won't notice anything out of the ordinary. The rest of us will just have a pang of nostalgia. The duration for keeping the spells are 180 seconds, 240 and 300 seconds, with a cooldown of 20, 18 and 16. On average, and take my word on this because it's impossible to calculate this definitively, but the average team fight would last for about 40 seconds. In that time, you can steal two spells. In that time, about 50 spells will be cast. It's your job to know which of the 48 you won't get. Good luck with that. With a two second cooldown via AGS, now you can have the ability to steal 25 of those 50. Or better yet, you can guarantee yourself the important ones. A two second cooldown means that you have the ability to make mistakes and fix them. As well as extremely niche things like stealing Black Hole from an Enigma with BKB and Lincolns. In a normal scenario, you wouldn't be able to pop Lincolns with TK or Fade Bolt because of the BKB. And you wouldn't be able to steal Black Hole because of Spell Steal needing to pop the Lincolns. With Ags, however, you can break Lincolns on the first second of a black hole and steal black hole on the third second of a black hole because spell steal is off of cooldown again. Other tricks include spell stealing a BKB piercer beforehand to anticipate needing it, like Primal Roar or something, but that's probably going to be hard to come by. What might trip you up is that you don't instantly gain black hole once you steal black hole. There's that green wispy thing that has to travel from Enigma to Rubik before it counts, which means the closer you are, the faster you get black hole. That projectile moves at 900 units a second, meaning being 1,525 units away makes the spell take nearly two seconds to get to you. You can't steal from Illusions, Creeps, or Roshan, but you can steal from Arkwarden's clone. And when the stars of Serendipity perfectly align, you can steal Creeps and Ancients abilities via stealing them from Doom, who himself found them via Devour. Even though it's entirely possible to happen every single game, in the millions upon millions of games of Dota, how often do you think a Rubik has managed to find himself with the ancient Prowler Shaman's Desecrate ability? That's the purple one. If you're playing as Doom and want to avoid giving away Doom, my tip would be to devour a Hill Troll Priest and self cast a heal, or even the tiny Satyr Banish Creep for a 0.2 second cast point purge, and then immediately just spam whatever. You, I mean, the, the intention right now is to, is to cast a spell immediately after Doom so Rubik can't steal it. As Rubik, you can't steal Morphling's ultimate, Walrus Kick, or Invoke, although you can steal Walrus punch which is technically an attack modifier gotta love dota's consistent inconsistency if you were to steal walrus punch and then use it you would actually be rewarded with a fancy little particle a, a neat little unique effect that's just made just for rubik it says Sucker Punch. A couple of abilities have that, even without you having the arcana. It's pretty clear that everyone who works on Dota also loves Rubik as much as we do. I wish I could say the same for fucking Oracle. Spells stolen maintain the level that they were stolen at. So stealing a level 4 version of that level 1 spell will update it. However, it doesn't refresh the cooldown. If you steal Black Hole and use it, and then steal 50 new spells to then steal Black Hole 179 seconds later, it'll still be on cooldown from that previous use because it has a 180 second cooldown. Using a refresher won't refresh spells Rubik doesn't currently have. Talents are not copied, which is an important thing to remember to stop forgetting. You can't have more than one spell stolen at one time. The two slots are specifically for spells with two components. Think Monkey King's Tree Dance plus Primal Spring, Morphling's Tribute Shift, and Puck's Orb and Jorn. This doesn't include subspells, but those are part of the main spell stolen. Usually, all egg spells 
themselves as separate from their egg's component. For instance, stealing egg ogre magi's fire blast doesn't also give you fire blast, they're independent. Rubik's eggs upgrades any spell stolen, so therefore if the upgrade is related to the hero itself, you get no bonus. For instance, Ogre Magi's Unrefined Fire Blast is the same level even with no other spells upgraded, which also means you can steal Unrefined Fire Blast without yourself needing an eggs. You can do the same with Zeus, with Eyes in the Forest, but I really wouldn't do it with Eyes in the Forest because Eyes in the Forest pretty much expire immediately after you lose Eyes in the Forest. Without eggs on Rubik, you won't get the eggs upgrade even if the enemy has the eggs version. Toggleable spells can be stolen, but only if the last thing that happens was them being turned on. If they were turned off, that doesn't really count as a usage of a spell. So, uh, for example, if Pudge rotted and then went into Meat Hook and then turned off his rot, you'd steal Meat Hook, not rot. Which is kind of lucky because there are very few instances where you'd want rot. All spells with a prolonged cast point on their normal heroes will also, you know, still be the same on Rubik. So Furion's Teleport, Meepo's Puff, stuff like that. Imagine a Rubik with the ability to instantly puff and then realize that you can actually puff to illusions, meaning that Rubik with a Manta or an Illusion Rune, which is probably more likely, could actually use Puff as an escape tool. But again, even in the millions and millions of games, do you think that's ever been done? Now imagine a Rubik who can instantly cast Requiem of Souls with all of Shadowfiend's souls at the time Requiem was stolen. Because yes, when you steal Requiem of Souls, for some reason, even though it's tied to Necromastery, which is a passive, you gain all of Shadowfiend's souls, not in terms of physical damage, but in terms of damage that comes from Requiem of Souls. Because yes, there are all sorts of specific spell perks that work like that. So let's talk about all of them. Alchemist's Unstable Concoction gives you both the casting of Concoction and the throwing of Concoction, even though they're technically separate skills. Imagine stealing Concoction and then not being able to throw it because you didn't get that spell. Funnily enough, that's exactly what happens if you steal another spell while Concoction is counting down. If you were to steal another spell which would cause you to lose Concoction, it would explode instantly on. Alchemist's Chemical Rage doesn't allow you to gift eggs as much as that would be amazing, right? Arc Warden's double can be stolen, granting items, a second TK, a second Fade Bolt, and all of those amped by a second Arcane Supremacy. It's a fun steal. Bane's Nightmare End can be cast to immediately wake up anyone put into sleep, regardless of if it was Rubik's or Bane's doing. Dark Willow's two ultimates are not given at the same time. One can't be stolen at the same time as the other. One can't be used at the same time as the other, even if you were to steal it right afterwards. Doom's Devour doesn't give Rubik a spell if Rubik eats a creep, which I mean is probably fine because if it actually did, it would crash the game, I'd imagine. Dragon Knight's Dragon Form doesn't give Rubik extra range like it does DK, but it does turn you into a cute little dragon. Ember Spirit's ult, Shadow Demon ult and any other ult that comes with charges instantly gives Rubik the maximum amount of charges regardless of how many he had the last time he stole it. As long as Rubik steals a new spell in between those two steals of that charge space spell. This is one of my favorite facts. That means that Rubik can get even more use out of a charge based ability than the heroes who actually leveled them. If you stole Demonic Purge and instantly cast those three charges on three different heroes and then stole literally any new spell, which you can do because you definitely have eggs in order to get Shadow Demon's Ags version of the spell, you can then go back and steal it at an 08. Because here's the rub, this might be a giant bug, or it might be the way that the game is intended to work. But we've run into a bit of a snag. We cast all three charges, causing Demonic Purge to be on cooldown for the next charge, which means that we can't cast it. But we did this and then gained three charges back. We have three charges at this point and a cooldown. We have them, we just can't cast any of them. So what do we do? As we established, absolutely no spell's cooldown can be refreshed by stealing it again and doing this can put it on cooldown. So the solution is to only ever use two charges and then steal a new spell and then go back and then use two new charges charges and then steal a new spell. As long as you always leave one in reserve, you can have an infinite amount of charges. Oh, and you will break the game if you do this with Ember Spirit and Remnants. The only spell that I would really consider not pay to lose when it comes to Rubik's Arcana is Chronosphere. While the other spells somewhat matter if they're green or whatever, Chronosphere is one of the few spells that can affect enemies as well as allies anyway. It's mostly common knowledge, but Faceless Void is immune in Rubik's Chronosphere, but doesn't gain a move speed buff. Rubik is not, however, immune in Voids. So do with that information what you will. Spells that depend on a level of another spell work totally fine on Rubik, even though he doesn't even 
Beam and have that spell. Luna's Eclipse gives you Lucent Beam at whatever level Luna has it. This works exactly the same with all heroes. It works the same with Zeus. It works the same with Enigma's Black Hole as we established with Midnight Pulse. It works exactly the same except for Spirit Breaker's Charge and Nether Strike and Greater Bash. Because Greater Bash is an attack damage thing, it doesn't connect with Nether Strike or Charge. I don't know why this is, but even if it did, it's probably not going to be very useful on a Rubik, is it? For all spells with passives as well as actives, Rubik can steal them and gain that passive. The most famous one is, of course, Slark's Shadow Dance, giving more move speed and HP regen. If you steal the main Chakram from Timbersaw while you both have eggs, you can <laughs> both gain Chakrams. If you steal the blue one, or one of you doesn't have eggs, you'll only get the one. Don't get me started on any attack modifying spells. <laughs> Berserker's Range turns you melee and drops you down to 150 range, but turning it off makes you melee but gives you back your range. As in, you attack from 550 or so units, but you do melee attacks. You become a melee hero. Bashes and vanguards work on you, and so does Battle Fury. But as I said, don't get me started on this. And finally, Monkey King's Wukong command on Rubik kind of reminds me of that Doctor Strange scene from Infinity War. You know the one. But now we're nearly at the end. It's just this in the final outro before we're done with Rubik forever. So let's just savor it. Yet again, our paths diverge with a support build and a mid build. Let's tackle the mid build first, considering it's more weighty in the item department. But before that, some general tips to cover both guides. Rubik is a spellcaster. He casts spells. This may seem obvious, but the first instinct for every player trying a new hero is to immediately default to what they already know that they can do with every other hero, which is, you know, to play them like their cause. It's the same every single time, right? If a new strength hero has just been added, people will go treads into Midas, into crit stick, into heart. If it's a new agility hero, they'll go phase into battle fury, into manta. If it's a new int, they'll go in treads, into blink, into bloodthorn. Now, I'm sure you could win a game as Rubik with all three of those builds, but more often than not, your best bet is to focus on the role you fill. If you're mid, you're a position 2, damaging disabler. If support, you're a greedy position 4, getting wards roaming but finding enough space to farm to be able to buy blink or eggs. The exact type of spellcaster you'll end up being is of course extremely dependent on the enemy team, so plan accordingly. It can be boiled down to three categories. Do your enemies by and large have extremely mana intensive nukes? If so, itemize towards arcane boots and mana region items, maybe even bloodstone if it's drastic. Do your enemies instead perhaps have no mana intensive nukes and in fact no nukes or stuns at all? Awesome! Itemize towards your own stun and nuke and accentuate that. Getting yules, getting ether lands, and then of course there's that very common scenario in which the enemy team consists of exactly alchemist, lycan, terrorblade, troll warlord, and lone druid, in which case screw utility altogether, you're building damage and attack speed and stealing all five of their transformations to cast them all simultaneously. I haven't had the privilege of ever being able to pull that off in a game, but I'm sure it'll happen someday to one of you. And now you know what to do. Something we don't really talk about enough is innate stats of a hero without any items and a discussion on if those stats are enough for the position that they're in. For example, Rubik is a spellcaster who likes to stay on the back end, meaning his strength gain isn't as important as, say, a bristleback. But he's a spellcaster with a mid-range 625 units disabled, which puts him closer to danger than a winter wyvern would be. His spells cost 125 and 150 mana respectively, but Arn is frequently spammed as, say, dazzle spells, and his base armor is a shock shocking negative 1, only rising to 10 by level 25. Would this perhaps mean itemizing towards an armor item benefiting us? Well, uh, let's see. And then of course we have the added idea of whatever spell that we want to steal obviously influencing the build as well. Like Blink Dagger would be even more important if we were stealing Ravages and all that, or stealing spells that required positioning changes. If we were doing spells that cost a lot of mana, more mana would be important. See, it, it's, it's, it's a malleable build. Rubik begins the game with 21 strength, which translates to a very average 578 health. Most heroes, in fact, start with this. With a plus 2 strength gain, he ends up with innately 1442 health by level 25. There are only 13 heroes with a lower strength gain than him, and most of them compensate in one way or another. Medusa has, you know, 1.3, but has mana shield. Terrorblade has 99 armor. Slark has his regen. Rubik used to be able to compensate via Nelfield, the ability that gave him a heaping dose of 22% magic 
resistance. But not anymore. This means that no matter what, we are squishy. With every item that we go, in the back of our mind, we need to consider, does this also assist in keeping me alive? If yes, it's a perfect purchase. And it doesn't have to be directly. It doesn't have to give you HP. It can be items like Aether Lens keeping you further away from the fight. Blink Dagger, which is something that we're going to be picking up anyway, but that's something to keep us safe. Glimmer Cab, Ghost Scepter, these sorts of things, right? Beyond that, we have Agility. We start off with 19 and then gain 2.1 every level. For most spellcasters, this is an irrelevant stat as long as we have at least one armor. Suffice to say, our IG gain is above average, so that's neat at least. Our primary attribute though is that beautiful int stat. We begin the game with 25 int, so 450 mana, and gain 2.7 a level, ending on 1410 mana at level 25. Yikes! This is the one wound in which we are hemorrhaging potential. A spellcaster who can't cast spells. What would you call that? Useless is a good name, reported is another. And so there we go, no matter what, we would need items and stolen spells that supplement our strength a little bit. I'll add you nearly nothing unless it's a game with a lot of armor reduction on the enemy team, because obviously the one thing that we'd want to avoid is getting below zero armor. As long as we can keep above zero armor, we're absolutely fine. And right now, without any armor reduction on us, we do. We do do that. And so there, a bit of strength strength, not much edgy, and int in a major way. We also need mobility items to compensate for our default and below average 290 move speed, a little bit of damage to bolster up our 53-ish starting damage, and believe me, we do need mana. At level 1, Fade Bolt costs 120 mana. With 450 mana total, we're not going to be able to cast that many Fade Bolts before we're out, and considering, you know, Fade Bolt is the thing that we need to win the lane, we should probably hope for something to give us more Fade Bolts. For mid, a Null Talisman Rush isn't a bad idea, although you can't really afford both Tangos and a Null at the start of the game. It's 5 gold too expensive. I mean at that point it's just frustrating more than anything. For efficiency, go Tangos, Mantle, Circlet, and then 3-4 to four seconds in, when you've generated enough passive gold at the start of the game, finish the Null and send it on the Courier while you creep block. By the time the creeps get to mid, the Courier will get to you, and you'll be granted with 6 damage and an amp to your level 1 Fate Bolt. You'll then collect Null Talismans until you can very comfortably outlast it your opponent, up to probably a maximum of three. With nulls not building into anything anymore, our only option is to keep them in our inventory until we have to sell them. With our build and three null talismans, we'll hit six slots filled by 15-ish minutes. So any more would just have to be put into the backpack where they won't do anything and don't really give us any stats. If Fade Bolt and one null talisman can allow for winning your lane, you could stop there and just get bottled. Putting that Nell into your inventory while you take a swig from your bottle works lovely, and that level 4 TK we suggested can help you snag most runes where you and your opponent both leave at the same time. Beyond that, you have three options for your boots of choice. Arcanes will be your default option, but arguments could be made for both phase and straight travels rush. The former more than the latter, probably. Arcane boots gives you mana, which we established is an extremely important part of Rubik's weakness. That's the thing that we'd want to be patching up. Without mana items, we'd only be able to cast two TKs and one Fade Bolt. To utilize Fade Bolt on lane, we'd either have to not level it up past level one to keep its mana cost cheap, or buy mana items. One of those is a better option than the other. Arcanes have the added benefit of breaking down and building into Etherlands, which is a point in their favor, but Phase Boots, in their new form, cover Rubik in a different area. They give armor. Against enemy lineups that deal more physical damage or against a TA, Shadow Fiend, or Slada, these are probably best. They also give added mobility with the movement speed, which allows for you to position yourself to better acquire spells. You'll usually get arcanes, but sometimes phase will end up being the best for your needs. And then there's travels, which will very rarely be the best thing to rush. Travels work in games in which you manage to do multiple things. First of which is simply win the lane, even stomp the lane. If you only break even, don't rush travels. Other reasons to get travels would be if you've sold on a fantastic ganking spell, it's like Meat Hook, like Fire Remnant, and of course, <laughs> like Rearm. The best way to counter Tinker? Be Tinker. Beyond that, you can really make an argument for all boots. Treads gives more strength, Tranks are great when playing from behind. Like a lot of Rubik, it'll ultimately be up for you to decide. Hopefully this is enough information to sort of guide your hand. Blink is your only core item as mid Rubik, even though Ags exist. It might seem counterintuitive, but there are absolutely games that can occur where you will have no use for Ags. Games where the best spell is Weaver Shikuchi and the next best spell is something shitty like Raises Static Link or something. In these scenarios where keeping the spell you have trumps all other ideas, Ags is just taking up space. But Blink... 
Blink will never be a bad item to have. Considering it's a core item on most heroes, and you're going to be stealing spells from most heroes, just for that stolen spell alone, you'd buy it. If you're consistently snagging Lions, Earth Spike, or Nyx's Impale, if you're getting Shackle Shots and Fissures, you'd benefit from Blink, so get Blink. Plus Blink assists in fixing bad positioning, which is a thing that, you know, we need to do as Rubik, and it also helps from getting from Creep Camp to Creep Camp faster. It's an escape, it's an aggressive tool, it's Rubik's core. Get Blink. Beyond that, it's really all situational. Ones that you normally go are Four Staff, Etherlands, and Kaya, and it's two upgrades. Uh, hmm. Yasha and Kaya give 16 agility and a tech speed, which you can usually ignore most of the time, but 35 movement speed, which is inarguably useful. Kaya and Sarge will however not give you that, but instead give you 16 strength and status resistance, translating to about 288 health. It also gives 16 damage, which is never bad. I'd go K and S more than Y and K, but you could make the argument that you personally do better with move speed, because if your court is Rubik, more HP won't really matter much. But Meteor Hammer is where Rubik shines. Because of course he does. This is the only way to play. Every single hero somehow benefits from Meteor Hammer. Even if it doesn't make any sense, I'll, I'll somehow form a narrative that makes Meteor Hammer seem like the best item to pick up. But not this time, because I mean, Rubik does it for me. I don't need to justify why Meteor Hammer is a good item, because you know Meteor Hammer is a good item. The four things that Rubik needs are strength, int, regen, and mobility. Blink does mobility, Meteor Hammer does the other three. 12 strength and int, 5 HP regen, 3 mana regen. Where it really comes into its own is when you consider that it has a 3 second delay and then a 2 second stun and 690 damage DOT. With Arcane Supremacy, Telekinesis lasts 3.2 seconds, allowing for perfect stun locking into Meteor Hammer. Meteor Hammer stuns for 2.9 seconds, adding with TK to achieve an unbroken 5.1 second disable, which can be further extended by whatever stolen spell you have. With a level 25 talent that lowers Telekinesis to seven seconds you can just stun anyone again almost infinitely and the cream of the crop 690 damage becomes at least 870 not even including further spell amp <sighs> by meteor hammer it's pretty good the amp works on towers too and then it's just whatever item you want to really fit the occasion if you're getting killed a lot don't be afraid to get bkb if you're managing to snag black hole every single fight don't be afraid to get refresher or octarine core to make the most out of it but a word to the wise don't fall into the trap of thinking wow i'm getting black hole all the time in this early game i'm sure this will continue on deep into late game to then find them with a blink and then jumping you on every fight now you've put 11,000 gold into two items that do nothing to save you. Against every single hero, there is usually one item that can trump them. Against Silencer, casting Global Silence and causing you to not be able to steal Global Silence, considering, you know, you're silenced, you can get Lotus Orb. And, I mean, Yules as well. But Lotus Orb has the benefit of being instant cast. I mean, I could just sit here in this section talking about every single item and in what way it would counter every single hero, if you were to pick it up on Rubik, but that could end up taking hours. So, in our final section, we'll get into support Rubik and finally put everything we've learned into practice. With less expendable income, the key is efficiency for Rubik. Invest in lots of clarities because you're not going to be able to get a bloodstone anytime soon. Stuff like that. Tranquil Boots are my personal choice for this position 4 role. They help you with ganks and keep you active more than arcs would. Don't get me wrong, I mean you can still go arcane boots, just, you know, know why you're doing so. In the early game, I like to encourage Urn of Shadows because it forces you to play Rubik like he's meant to be played. Sitting back and passively gaining levels with pulls ain't what Rubik's made for, son. It's like key a beautiful stallion in a barn and he could be off gallivanting in a lush green field. Urn of Shadows is an item for heroes that are constantly skirmishing, picking fights and killing heroes. It's an item that can't be picked up on a farmer, unless of course you're Spectre, and any hero who ends up picking up Urn of Shadows is locked away from becoming a farmer, lest he absolutely gets no use out of the item he spends all of his money on. Rubik is a hero who could feasibly be played as a passive hero. He could farm mid, never leaving until he buys an egg. He could camp at bot lane supporting his carry, never letting him die, but also never achieving a kill because your stun does zero damage. He could do that, but then he'd lose. I like Urn of Shadows less for what it does, but more for what it causes us to do. Urn of Shadows is an item that pushes us out of our little hidey hole and into the world of roaming and ganking. 
Earn gives a bit of armor, a bit of mana regen, but the active doesn't do anything if Rubik's not killing. And the reason we want to push Rubik towards kills is that his spikes are level 6 and level 9 when supremacy is maxed, and then just a gradual decline all the way to obscurity. Sure, an Ags might elevate that, but as a position 4 you're going to begin that at about 90 minutes in. And especially considering without already going out of your way to push your level 6 and 9 power spike advantage, you're not going to get an Ags at all. You don't have the luxury of farming as a support Rubik, but you're also extremely item and level dependent. If you're not level 6 by minute 10, you're easily the top candidate for the Tome of Knowledge, and if you manage to get Urn at level 6, you can use that spike and power to snowball into every other item you'd ever need. The reason for this, and the reason that we'd want to do this at all, is that spell steal capitalizes off of the spell that the enemy hero has maxed. From level 6 to 9, it is impossible. Impossible for a hero to have two spells maxed out. Sven will max Stormhammer with a level in Cleave and Warcry. Lena will max Dragon Slave with a level in her W and a level in her E. Skyrath will max Arcane Bolt with one or two levels in his Slow and Amp. No hero in the game can have his burst spell and his stun or his amp, or his other burst spell max at this time. Nobody can have two spells at the same time maxed. No one but Rubik. Rubik, at level 7, can have a maxed out Fade Bolt, and a maxed out Lucent Beam, or Brain Sap, or Shockwave, or Burrow Strike, Lightning Bolt, Cold Feet, on and on and on, forever. And because of this, for those three levels, you will become the strongest hero in the game. If that's not enough, consider this. Ignore edge cases like Clockwork or Gyrocopter who can deal like a thousand damage, if their opponent makes no effort to run away. The average damage any bursty hero can do by level 7 is about 300 damage from their max spell, 300 or so from their long cooldown ultimate, and 100 from their two levels that they have in that second spell. And that's if their second spell is a damaging spell. You can find yourself a Disruptor with a 400 damage Q and a 0 damage W and E. But then there's Rubik, stealing their prized max spell and turning it back on them, plus Fade Bolt, plus Arcane Supremacy, plus Telekinesis, to deal upwards of 750 damage. And all of that adds up to why we go Urn of Shadows, to force ourselves to be the best versions of us that we can be. Beyond that, I go 4 staff, mostly just because I'm less confident in saving 2250 straight for blink. 4 staff's great and all, and is much easier to purchase than blink on account of it being built out of 3 moderately cheap components that you can buy so as to not lose any reliable gold right as you're about to be killed. If I'm doing really well, I will again rush blink, never prioritizing it over at least 2 wards on the map at all times. Then my choice of Yules, Glimmer, or Ghost Scepter for defensive purposes, and at that point hopefully you secretly snuck in enough gold from the last hit here, a kill still there, to be able to sooner or later afford Aghanim Scepter. But Aghanim Scepter is a chore to get man, as position 4. <laughs> you can't rush Aghanim Scepter, you can't force Aghanim Scepter, you can't leave your teammates with absolutely no vision of the river and all that, because you're so close to that ogre club or staff of wizardry <sighs> but if you were to manage to get to eggs at that point just refer to the last section from mid rubik and that's pretty much it for items now let's use them Rubik's just fun, you know? He's fun to talk about, he's fun to theorycraft, hopefully you found out after over an hour that he's fun to learn about. Now, a few tips just before we end for how to counter him. Sorry, I, I have to throw a bone, right? First, make sure you're constantly aware of the fact that there's a Rubik in the game. He's like a Pudge or a Techie is in that he makes you fundamentally change your behavior when he's in a game with you. Pudge causes you to mind your positioning, Techies causes you to avoid stepping anywhere ever, and Rubik causes you to need to constantly check that the last spell that you cast at any point in the game was your shittiest one. For Tide, it's Anchor Smash, for Pudge, it's Rot, and for Blood Secrets, Blood Rage. The alternatives, of course, are Ravage, Meat Hook, and fucking Rupture. You don't want to really be giving these to Rubik. I'd recommend always checking what Rubik stole as well. Just click on him and look what his new greyed out icon is. You can even ping it to alert your team. If he steals Black Hole, you're going to play way different to if he stole Midnight Falls. You know what I mean? So just be wary. And, uh, I mean, in reality, playing against Rubik teaches you just enough about how to play Rubik as playing Rubik does. The best Rubik's in the world know by a glance at the icon what a spell does, so playing every new hero, watching people play, all of that is important. In the heat of a team fight, you don't want to be stuck mousing over the skill window for Ice Blast reading the novella that is its description. You just want to cast it. But honestly one of the last tips that I'd be able to give for people going up against Rubik is... Enjoy yourself. 
I think so, yeah. Enjoy yourself. That would be a good tip. If you're getting your spells stolen by Rubik constantly, that's a good thing because you're playing with really, really talented people. You're trying your hardest to not get your spells stolen and then Rubik is stealing your spells. I mean, at this point, you can enter in one of these fantastic little rivalries where you're constantly trying to one-up each other. It's really, really fun if you let it be fun. If you get mad that you failed to, you know, anchor smash after a ravage and then Rubik got one, <laughs> you're playing Dota wrong, really. You should be proud of that Rubik for getting it, because that's an achievement. It's hard to get Ravage, and you, admittedly, are trying to stop him from getting Ravage. Just compliment each other, man. Compliment the Rubik. Maybe the Rubik's learning. Maybe the Rubik's a real pro. Maybe you can learn something from the Rubik. Maybe he can learn something from you. Compliment each other. He's on the enemy team, but he's not your nemesis. You're all just boys and girls wanting to play Dota. So enjoy your time. As a Rubik, really enjoy the time you spend failing to snag Ravage and ending up with Anchor Smash and a 16 second cooldown on Spellsteel until you can replace it, as much as you would enjoy the time you spend with Ravage team wiping the enemy. It, uh, it's meant to be fun. And if you're playing someone going up against a Rubik, if he steals your best spells, all you can really do is laugh. Congratulate him and vow to practice to make sure he doesn't pull a fast one on you next time. At no point in what I just said in that last paragraph and in the last hour did I ever mention that you should feel angry or spiteful in a game that you're willingly spending time in. It's not healthy. By the time this video goes up, it'll be 2019. So why not focus on being a more positive player with the beginning of this fresh new year? Can't hurt. But anyway, can I just say that Valve have done something really smart in doing popular votes plus making the Arcana require you to play more games as Rubik. The popular vote means that they know by a show of hands what Arcana is going to make the most money and requiring wins with the Arcana will have more people playing Dota with that Arcana, advertising it for everyone else. Don't forget that first and foremost, Valve are capitalists. They know what they're doing. The Arcana was just released, or I guess it was released a few weeks ago by the time you watch this. There's thousands of players playing in poorly right this second, so if you're afraid of embarrassing yourself, trying something new, don't be. I mean, on the topic of a new year, it's like going to the gym, right? And you're not gonna stand out because everyone else is failing with him right now anyway. In fact, Rubik is as strong as he will ever be for a very, very long time. So there's no better time to learn how to play him than right now while he's the easiest, while he's so strong that mistakes aren't as costly and misplays don't cost team fights. He's got his stats, his damage, he's really comfortably balanced right now, so get in there, and practice him, win some him, uh, and above all else, enjoy yourself. But as we close out this video, for the longest time there was this section right before this point that said stuff like, itemize towards stealing sleight of fist by changing your build. If you know you're going to steal Ball Lightning, buy Bloodstone. If you're going to steal Strafe, get the plus 60 damage talent and get crit. Know the spells that you want to steal and build towards them. At the last minute, I decided to cut that sort of thing for fear of encouraging naughty behavior. I read in the last chapter of a book once that when people learn new things in essays and reports and papers, they tend to remember the last thing that they read more than the first thing that they read. I mean, it makes sense, right? I mean, the last thing is going to be closest to present day. I don't really remember much else about that book, but I think that's good advice. At the very end of this video, I could have ruined it all by advocating to build Battle Furies on Rubik. Instead, I ended on a nice wholesome support Rubik and it was good. So now there's only really my final farewells to say. In 2012, I had my first ever game of Dota 2. Serendipitously, at the time, Rubik was added to Dota 2. He and I have been on this train ride for the exact same amount of time. We got on at the same station. I got on as Rubik got on. It seems fitting that one of the last Dota guides that I ever do is serendipitously one about my buddy Rubik. Serendipitously at the time everyone's playing him, and serendipitously at the time where people are wanting to learn how to play him better on account of the Rubik Arcana that serendipitously happened to end up being given to him. But this is where our paths finally diverge. While you ride this train further into the distance, Rubik, I'll be getting off. I wish you well, buddy, and I wish everyone who plays you well too. As for me, my stop's coming up, just up the tracks is Oracle Station. <laughs> well, this went a little longer than you would have thought, eh? Uh, a quick outro of this episode, you've earned it. Uh, that is if you're still awake. I've been told people drift off to these videos at night, which is, which is wholesome. It also means that you're not skipping the middle ads, so I'm earning more money. 
So don't be concerned if you wake up the next morning with this unconscious but extreme urge to build a Squarespace website. Now you know the reason. Anyway, in an effort to help me remove those cumbersome ads from my videos, as well as supporting me in general, we have our pledges. This video's pledges are Chris 1996, Foxy of fucking Luxley, a guy who named himself after every other patron that I've ever had, Miles Lou, Asbestos, Jan Wilkes, Kim Nelson, Lincoln, Mow the Lawner, I'll Drop an Engine on Your Feet, Shadow Sweetheart, Squirty McFlirty, Tefetu, Apache Mari wearing a headwear neckwear nicknamed as Hatcrafter, Aeria, Christian Rudder, Damn Cleric, Grumman, Hey, that's pretty good, Jonathan Scary, Keegan Mayer, King Gizzard and the Shitty Wizard, Tsunami Shadow, Mike, Two, Malakot, Mini Shoof, Much Skill Very Pro, Wow, Neutral Platonic Land Base, Vertebrate, Nay, Orange Filter Sky, Paul Moran, Peyton Dean, Procrastination Studios, Prod, Pro S, Punith P, Raphael Silver, Rhett Mitchell, Rick Flareon, Woo, RJ shouldn't have to play position five every game, Shiva's Guard, Scar, Spencer Davis, Sterile Cheryl, Taco God, Boomdog, The Average Saiyan Warrior, The Choco Taku, Thomas Johnson, Uncommon Alias, Ways of 107, Yabba Smiggy, and everybody else. So yeah, see you next time.